to check to see if we have Okay, good afternoon. The time now is 4.10. Um, I would like to thank you guys for joining us this afternoon. My name is Saran Purcell. I'm from the office of uh, Board President Eric Adams. I will be a presiding officer for this afternoon for our annual board board meeting and public hearing for September the 8th, 2021. I am the Director of External Boards and Executive Assistant and Deputy Board President. I am joined by um, Richard uh, David Perez, um, on technical support. I'm also joined by my colleague Hercules Reed, um, who'll be assisting us with roll call and Grant Yandick from the office, also from the unit of the deputy board president. Um, so with that being said, we would like to get started. We do have a, a robust agenda and we did get some last minute changes to some of the resolutions that were circulated. So we'll try to incorporate that as best as we can as our last email came in about uh, one minute prior to the meeting. Um, so, so good afternoon. Welcome to today, today's board board. We are being conducted via WebEx conference. There are 4 items on tonight's agenda. Please note that this is a virtual meeting being recorded to comply with public law and transparency. It'll be available on the board. President Adams 1 Brooklyn YouTube, uh, YouTube page. The items on the agenda is going to be looking at accepting the minutes from June 1st. We're also looking at a presentation from the Department of Senior Planning regarding open restaurant and sidewalk cafe text amendment. We also are going to have a public hearing and vote regarding the Department of Senior Planning health, fitness, and fresh text amendment. That's two different items um, unfinished business and new business. So while we were waiting, we're trying to get an idea of um, if we have a full on um, uh, forum to do road call. Um, at the moment, um, what we are going to do in the interest of time, we are going to uh, come back to acceptance of the minutes and going through roll call and go straight into our presentation from the Department of Sea Planning regarding open restaurants and sidewalk uh, cafe. So, representative from the New York City Department of Planning are here this afternoon to present this attended zoning regulation. That would allow for New York City Department of Transportation administrators the permanent open restaurant program. The proposal would remove sidewalk cafe regulations from the zone and resolution to increase geographical eligibility as sidewalk cafes will become a part of a unified sidewalk and roadway outdoor dining program administrated by DOT. The proposed open street and sidewalk cafe zone and text amendment is being presented this afternoon. Representative will be able to take questions from board board members to ensure the community board have time to consider this proposal. Um, and will be followed by a public hearing scheduled for October the 6th, which should be our next board board meeting. After the presentation, representatives will be available to answer questions. So with that being said, uh, we'd like to welcome Benjamin Huff, Senior transportation specialist uh, with uh, Department of City Planning, um, who will then introduce his colleague who will be presenting the first item on the agenda for this evening. Thank you so much. With that being said, Benjamin, the floor is yours. Take it away. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, we're presenting today on the text amendment uh, that would reduce uh, geographic restrictions for sidewalk cafes, but to start off, 
um, my colleague Dash Henley at the Department of Transportation. He's sort of going to do an a, initial presentation on what um, the sort of the vision of the permanent open restaurant program will be, um, and then we will. City planning will pick up and do another presentation that will focus specifically on the text amendment uh, before the board today. So to start off, um, I will share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yep. All right. Dash, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Ben. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, yes. Okay, cool. I can hear you well. I assume. Yes. Thank you. Uh, it's new headsets at GOT, so haven't tested them out yet. <laughs> um, uh, so, as Ben said, my name is Dash Henley. Uh, I'm a planner at the Brooklyn Borough Commissioner's Office at DOT, and uh, we're looking to present today on the draft uh, work for the permanent open restaurants program, uh, which would give restaurants the options of sidewalk and roadway seating uh, for outdoor dining. Uh, the program is looking to balance the many needs of the street and sidewalk, uh, keeping in mind not only restaurants, but all other users as well. And we're looking to take what's worked and hasn't worked in the past, both in the pre-COVID, uh, the emergency program, uh, when developing the permanent future guidelines. Uh, I just want to make it clear, and I know some folks have seen this presentation already, so it'll be a reminder that uh, my presentation is covering both sidewalk and roadway dining. But what DOT and DCP are asking uh, for specific feedback on is the opinion on the specific sidewalk cafe text amendment. And with that in mind, we'll uh, go to the next slide. And uh, one more. Cool. Uh, so prior to COVID, as I'm sure most people are aware, we did have uh, sidewalk cafes. Uh, and a few options in the roadbed, but there were far fewer of them. Uh, the majority of the programs were administered by what used to be called the Department of Consumer Affairs and what's now called the Department of Consumer and Worker uh, Protection. And DOT did run one small pilot of public roadway seating, which is here the uh, 25 street seats, um, but that's a very low number of them. Uh, most of them were in Manhattan. And our understanding is that the relatively low participation in that program was due in large part uh, to the costs associated with it and the cumbersome process in getting those approved. Thanks, please. Uh, so as a result of COVID, we created the emergency uh, open restaurants program. Uh, what happened there was the city suspended existing rules. Uh, through an executive order, and DOT created a fast and simple way for restaurants to conduct their business in the public right away. And since launching a little over a year ago, uh, about 11,000, uh, over 11,000 restaurants have now participated, and that's helped save about 100,000 jobs, uh, according to estimates that would have otherwise been lost. And by many accounts, the program has been not just a lifesaver for those restaurants, but also has shown the city uh, that outdoor dining is possible and has shown that uh, the city can have this incredible uh, vitality uh, brought to our streets and sidewalks. And we think that it's been a real beacon of hope in an otherwise uh, dark time and a sign of what we can uh, do to make a better future as well. Next slide, please. Um, one more. Oh, sorry. Oh, there we are. Okay. Uh, so all of that being said, uh, we learn, we know that there have been successes and challenges, uh, with the program, and we've tried to learn from all of those as we develop the permanent program. Uh, so on the positive side, we think the robust use of the emergency program, uh, was helped by uh, three different factors. Uh, number one was that no geographies were off limits. Any restaurant with ground floor frontage or sidewalk or roadway space that met the siting criteria could participate. Uh, second, the program is free uh, and very easy to access, unlike the pre COVID sidewalk program, uh, which required months of multiple reviews uh, by multiple agencies. And third, the element of roadway dining gave restaurants brand new options uh, for diners, uh, particularly those that might not have had enough space. 
on the sidewalk to accommodate a cafe and uh, as well as those that couldn't operate uh, indoors during the height of the pandemic. Uh, that being said, uh, we know that there have been challenges. Uh, the, the speed of the rollout and the fact that the program was built from scratch under emergency circumstances of the pandemic uh, did create some confusion uh, with rules and regulations. And as DOT learned more about operating a program like this, uh, some of that guidance changed over time. Uh, Second, we learned about specific challenges with roadway seating and its interaction with roadway and the sidewalk. Uh, so we know that we need to stay in close contact with uh, other city agencies like FDNY uh, to make sure that safety is ensured uh, with these setups. And finally, uh, there's the issue of enforcement, and that goes two ways. Uh, we've heard from restaurants that already overburdened with the pandemic and might feel squeezed and over inspected and don't want any extra burdens, uh, and particularly as most are just trying to follow the rules and stay in business. Uh, but on the other hand, we uh, have issues with making sure that restaurants do comply with these rules, uh, particularly concerned with uh, safety and accessibility. Uh, so we need to make sure that we balance uh, both of those uh, concerns while maintaining um, uh, safety and accessibility. Uh, next, please. Uh, so all of that uh, being said, we think that the program has been a massive success and uh, the city council voted in late 2020 uh, to establish a permanent program and the mayor has charged us with uh, developing that program. And doing so requires changing a number of different laws that control outdoor dining in non-emergency situations. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're proposing for the permanent program, and then return to the topic of the legal changes um, needed to affect the way. Next, please. Um, okay, so to start with, we anticipate that just as in the emergency program, DOT will administer the permanent option for both sidewalk seating and roadway dining uh, with similar rules to sidewalk cafes, but that the program would be available uh, citywide. Uh, next, please. And when final, the specific design guidelines will be very clear and will revolve around those principles that I spoke about before that balance the use of uh, space by the restaurant uh, while uh, maximizing the experience and openness uh, to the general public. And notably, the size and the scale of the cafes will be defined by the size of the street furniture and sidewalk, uh, which I'll talk a little bit in more detail um, next. Next slide, perfect. Um, so for most of the city, the old eight foot rule will hold, uh, meaning that we need to have, or the restaurants need to have a minimum of eight foot uh, clearance uh, on the sidewalk to allow for everyone to pass by. Uh, but we are exploring other options in special cases. Uh, so we're looking at considerations for areas that have a lot of pedestrian traffic, um, so it might require more clearance or areas uh, that might be too narrow to meet that requirement, but it should be part of the program. And let's go two slides, please. There. And uh, the next part I wanted to talk about is seasonality. So we have learned that we, that the program uh, has been used in the winter time, but that going forward with the permanent program, it would probably be best uh, to have it seasonal so that it would not operate in the winter. Uh, we are still working on the exact guidelines for this, so we want to make clear that the temporary program would be operating uninterrupted through the 2022 winter season. So locations that have setups now uh, don't have to take them down uh, through that winter. Uh, the permanent program would come after that uh, with the new set of rules. And once that came into place, then uh, the program would no longer be available during the winter. And we're looking at design options that help out with making those setups a little 
easier to move or take apart. Uh, and we're also looking at the possibility of a hardship waiver uh, for locations that um, would have trouble removing those setups. Next, please. Okay. Uh, so, when looking at moving both the legal authority of the program to DOT and creating a new process for the roadway setups uh, themselves, uh, we're looking to streamline the review process as much as possible uh, while still leaving in place the essential rules of agency and public review. And in order to make that happen, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have to go through these three steps. Uh, so first, uh, which is the focus of today, is removal of locational prohibitions through zoning. Uh, so it's really key to unlocking the full citywide universe of applicability uh, and consolidating control and accountability for that program with DOT or city agency that we remove those uh, locational prohibitions. And we're working with the city council to enact appropriate legislation that'll update laws uh, governing sidewalk cafes and uh, then create a new set of rules that govern roadwalk, oh, sorry, roadway cafes. Uh, so those are the, the three actions needed to, uh, to create that permanent program. Next, please. And this is a little bit more zoned out uh, version of the timeline. Uh, so following those zoning and legal changes, we anticipate rulemaking that will formalize um, the program and application details. And then once that happens, we'll have a formal opening up of the application window for the new program uh, before it goes into effect. And once again, I just wanted to reiterate that the current program will be in place uh, through the winter of 2022. Uh, so just to give you know that uh, clarification on the timeline of this process will be going on. Uh, through 2022. Uh, so the expectation is that those restaurants will have ample time to transition into a new process if they choose uh, to continue um, into the permanent program. And we think that these are the first steps that we need to make that program permanent. Uh, but as you can see, there are multiple steps in this process, and each of those uh, would welcome public input and review. Next, please. So just inclusion, we're really excited to be able to make this program permanent. Like I was saying before, uh, COVID has really reshaped the way New Yorkers think about our streets and how we can use them. And we think it's been a silver lining and an otherwise understandably awful um, pandemic. And we're looking to uh, take advantage of that and get this um, program right. Uh, so we're looking for uh, feedback uh, now and going forward. Uh, we can share the link to the website uh, so that everyone here uh, can forward that to others uh, to get input as well. Um, and once again, just want to reiterate one more time that the roadway portion of this presentation is very much preliminary and the primary purpose in presenting to the board today uh, is to gather feedback on city planning's proposed text amendment changes uh, related to specifically to sidewalk cafes. And so with that in mind, uh, I'll turn it back to Ben and Carolyn, and I'll be here for questions afterward as well. Sorry. Uh, ben, Caroline? Yep, looks like she's bringing it up now. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, well, hello everybody. Um, ben Huff again. I'm presenting on the text amendment and I'm joined, I, I forgot to introduce her earlier, but my colleague, Carolyn Grossman Marr, who's the director of our regional planning department and has been uh, working with me on the text amendment on the city planning side. All right, next slide. So, as Dash uh, discussed, there's three main legal processes to create the open restaurants program. Uh, the first uh, step, which will be the focus on this presentation, is the removal of locational prohibitions by a zoning text amendment. So, unnecessary zoning restrictions stand in the way of thousands of restaurants from participating in an outdoor dining uh, past the emergency. And we think this zoning proposal is really key to allowing um, all restaurants 
um, to, to have the ability to apply and then, um, you know, sort of be able to have this program under a single agency at the Department of Transportation. Next slide. So the proposed text amendment would remove the entirety of chap uh, Article 1, Chapter 4 of the zoning resolution and related text in special districts and other areas that relate to sidewalk cafes to fully remove zoning from dictating the location of cafes. This will allow any restaurant to apply to DOT for a sidewalk cafe if they can meet the required clear path and setting criteria. And we'll get more in detail on how this works. Uh, next slide. So first, a bit of context. Uh, in March of 2020, there were roughly 27,000 restaurants in the five boroughs. 25% of these restaurants were located in Brooklyn. Uh, these restaurants range from small neighborhood cafes to mid-sized high-end dining establishments to multi-level catering halls for large events. For the purpose of this presentation, we'll be focusing just on ground floor restaurants with access to the street, as it is these restaurants that have the ability to apply for a sidewalk cafe. Next slide. So sidewalk cafes have long been a part of the New York City streetscape and with them, the laws governing cafes have evolved over the years. When the uniform land use review process came into existence in the 1970s, each sidewalk cafe approval was subjected to a full ULIP review as part of its revocable consent to use street space. Almost immediately, it was recognized that this level of review was onerous and time consuming and difficult to manage for each individual restaurant. So in 1980, the commission put into place a framework attempting to streamline the process uh, by naming areas of the city where sidewalk cafes were allowed. Since then, the program has been amended dozens of times to make more and more fine grained distinctions on where and what kind of cafes are allowed in different areas. And up until COVID-19, zoning worked at, as a gatekeeper to where sidewalk cafes could exist. Next slide. Under the zoning rules, which are currently suspended, zoning dictated three different types of cafes, as, as Dash had mentioned. So most commonly were unenclosed cafes, which allowed for readily removable tables, chairs, and fencing with no allowable overhead coverage other than umbrellas or retractable roofs. Uh, next were small sidewalk cafes, which were unenclosed cafes containing no more than a single row of tables and chairs adjacent to the street line and could extend no further than four and a half feet from the building. And these were located specifically in high density areas. Um, third were enclosed cafes, which were defined as extensions of the building into the sidewalk using light building materials and 50% transparency on its walls. Next slide. So as we discussed, zoning held the geographic restrictions on where these cafe types were allowed. The public could view where cafes were allowed on city planning's zoning and land use map or Zola application. So yellow are where areas where only small cafe types were allowed. Purple are areas where only unenclosed or small cafe types were allowed. And green is where all cafe types were permitted. Importantly, you can see a lot of areas where cafes weren't allowed at all, even if the sidewalks were wide and conditions otherwise would have allowed it. Red is specifically, uh, red are areas that specifically pro were prohibited from having cafes, and blue is where residential areas of the city pre precluded sidewalk cafes from occurring. Next slide. So in March of 2020, the existing uh, DCWP program had 1,224 cafes actively licensed citywide, mostly unenclosed, and the vast majority of which were in Manhattan. Next slide. So as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the New York state economy went on pause in March of 2020. This action resulted in a ban on indoor dining that impacted the industry harshly. We saw employment in the restaurant industry drop 64% from first quarter to second quarter 2020. Um, sadly, the city also lost some longtime institutions um, as continued restrictions and aversions to indoor dining made it very difficult for dining establishments to operate. Next slide. So 
in order to provide support for the restaurant industry and the need to move dining outdoors, New York City stood up the open restaurants program, which allowed for the emergency use of sidewalks and roadways by restaurants. This was achieved by suspending zoning and rules through executive order that allowed restaurants to conduct outdoor dining in the right of way. All zoning regulations and admin code rules related to the sidewalk cafe program were suspended and the emergency self-certified program was set up at DOT. Street sweeping rules were scaled back and restaurants were allowed to set up in the curb lane to provide additional seating. Restaurants could go to a website that the Department of Transportation created to apply for a sidewalk cafe, roadway cafe, or a combination of both. Next slide. So as we already discussed, um, we, we saw a lot of success in this program. Over 11,500 restaurants participated in the open restaurants program to date. In particular, the city saw a huge surge of outdoor dining occur in the outer boroughs, especially Brooklyn. 10,000 of the restaurants used the sidewalk for their outdoor dining set up either just as a sidewalk cafe or as a combination of sidewalk cafe plus uh, roadway cafe. And City Hall estimates that 100,000 jobs uh, could have been sa were saved in the restaurant industry that could have been lost had the city not allowed for this move outdoors. Next slide. So we've seen that the challenges that the NYC restaurant industry has faced from the COVID-19 pandemic and open restaurants has been essential to them surviving the past year. Uh, the industry still has many challenges ahead, but open restaurants has been able to provide the twin benefit, of both helping small businesses flourish while making New York City streets and sidewalks some of the best dining options in the world. Next slide. So during the emergency program, two and a half thousand restaurants were permitted in areas that would have been prohibited or limited under existing zoning. But the proposed text amendment will allow them as long as they meet the setting criteria outlined by the Department of Transportation. So if you look at this map on the right, in red are restaurants in areas that specifically prohibited zoning. These include commercial mid blocks, special districts under elevated rail lines, in blue are all the grandfathered restaurants in residential areas. So zoning doesn't allow restaurants in residential areas, but many of these restaurants predate zoning and so have remained. We estimate there are about 2,900 citywide and about 1,000 participating in the open restaurants program. Uh, yellow are cafes that would have been limited to the small typology only. Next slide. So there are many reasons why these um, areas were prohibited from having sidewalk cafes, but what we've seen is that these cafes can work in many more locations than zoning contemplated. So if you look at this caf um, picture of a cafe in Bushwick, um, this uh, cafe would have been prohibited from a sidewalk cafe simply because it was on a street that had an elevated rail line. Um, but here you can see um, they're able to provide this nice space pretty far away from the elevated rail. And we think what's most important is the sidewalk condition and having enough room for pedestrians. And we think that's a siting criteria, not a neighborhood criteria. So we really think that zoning is not working and that physical rules would work far better. Next slide. So Dumbo is a special district that specifically does not allow sidewalk cafes, but we have seen some great examples of restaurants doing outdoor dining during the emergency program. This would allow restaurants to apply as long as they meet the setting criteria. So under this proposed text amendment, all special districts will, uh, will become eligible, including the ones that specifically prohibited sidewalk cafes. Next slide. So the blocks around Grand Central are barred from having sidewalk cafes by zoning, um, I think just mostly because it was considered a very congested area. This restaurant would not have been allowed to have a sidewalk cafe, um, but we see that they've been able to have one during the emergency program. Under this proposal, restaurants in central business districts will likely need to meet a 12 foot clear path requirement to allow for more pedestrian traffic but they will be allowed to participate as long as they can meet these additional requirements. Next slide. So those were all examples of areas where zoning explicitly barred restaurants from participating. Another gap in the sidewalk cafe program is restaurants in residential districts. 
in many cases, we know restaurants wanted to have sidewalk cafes in these areas and would request zoning overlays to legalize them. And this proposal would eliminate that burden. Uh, this proposal, again, will not allow new restaurants from occurring in these areas as of right, but it will allow restaurants that exist in these areas, like this cafe in Clinton Hill, to apply for a sidewalk cafe as long as they meet the siting criteria. Next slide. Also note that as a consequence of removing the zoning rules, we are also collapsing the different types of cafes. So the distinction of only small cafes will be removed. And this will work in conjunction with the supplemental clear path requirements that will address the need for wider pedestrian zones in some of the city's most traffic locations. Next slide. And finally, ending the zoning program also effectively ends the specific category in zoning called the enclosed cafe program. This program served a specific purpose pre-pandemic for joint city planning and DCWP review of sidewalk cafes with particular conditions, uh, which will no longer be necessary or applicable in the context of the future permanent program that's in development at DOT. So there are currently 102 pre-COVID licensed enclosed cafes. Um, again, they have this license um, given to them by the city pre-COVID. So we will work to grandfather these enclosed cafes and allow them to continue in the permanent program, but we won't be allowing sort of new enclosed cafes uh, to apply. Next slide. So other cleanup actions in the text amendment include removing definitions and cross references to cafes, removing text that precludes operable windows that service outdoor restaurants, ensuring that the no con no enclosure provisions require a restaurant to be fully indoors as a condition of its zoning district and clarifying sidewalk widening text to ensure it does not conflict with the operation of the open restaurants program. Um, and if people want to see um, all of sort of the proposed text deletions and, and modifications, we, we will make that available to the board. Next slide. So zooming into Brooklyn, um, you can see the, these are the current sidewalk cafe regulations that exist in zoning. So green are areas that allow all cafes, and you can see these are along the many commercial corridors and particularly along sort of Western Brooklyn and Northern Brooklyn. Um, red are areas where cafes are prohibited um, as a result of zoning, so they're completely barred, and those you can see along, they match along the elevated rail lines um, and special districts of Dumbo and East New York. Um, and blue is residential areas of the city where um, restaurants would not be allowed to apply for sidewalk cafes. There's a small amount of um, sort of purple, which allow uh, unenclosed small or, or unenclosed only. Um, next slide. So the old process generated 223 total cafes um, in Brooklyn. Um, the breakdown of these was there were 204 unenclosed sidewalk cafes, uh, four small unenclosed cafes, and 15 enclosed cafes. And you can see that the majority of these sort of occurred in, in North Brooklyn and, and Brownstone, Brooklyn. So not as much sort of in the, the southern part of the, the borough or eastern part. Next slide. Uh, so under the emergency program, um, we've had much more, um, over, over 2,000 uh, restaurants um, participate in outdoor dining. Um, there's been 900 sidewalk cafes, 337 just roadway cafes, and about 1,400 restaurants that are participating that, that have both a sidewalk and a roadway cafe. And I think what's uh, important to note is that 125 of these cafes are in areas that would have been prohibited under zoning, and 321 are in residential or no cafe zoning areas. So this, really this text amendment would be ensuring that these restaurants, roughly 500 restaurants, would be allowed to continue to participate in the program um, after the emergency ends. Next slide. Uh, so to summarize all, 
Uh, we are at the start of a multi pronged legislative process. So this text was referred out on June 17th and was referred to the 59 community boards and five borough presidents for 90 days. And we expect that text to come back to the city planning commission this fall. Um, we're currently going out almost every night, uh, Monday through Thursday to community boards, um, showing a similar presentation with them where we tailor and show specifically how the text amendment will work um, in their community boards. Um, as this is going on, we anticipate city council actions to be underway, uh, sort of continuing that process of updating the sidewalk cafe program and fully fleshing out the roadway cafe program uh, through a DOT rulemaking process. And we think, you know, underway during the summer and informed in part by city uh, uh, community board consultations will be a, a DOT design review process that will be ro rolled out soon that city planning will be involved in. So we don't, again, we will do not expect full program launch until late 2022 or early 2023 of the permanent open restaurants program. And that allows uh, plenty of time for restaurants to transition to the permanent program should they choose to do so. Um, just want to, to say again, we expect the, um, the wrap up of sort of the text amendment public review done, uh, September 27th and, uh, city planning commission will hear the text amendment in October. Um, yep. Just want to restate those. So that is our presentation today on the open restaurants program and the zoning text proposal and my colleagues and I are happy to take your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ben, Dash, Caroline, for that presentation. Um, before I open up the floor to members, I do have uh, two questions I'd like to pose. What will be the role that community boards are given in regards to future development of design and operational standards? Ben, Dash? So, were you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I can I can take that one, and I'm not sure if Ben and uh, Carolyn have anything uh, to add as well. Uh, so with this, uh, for sidewalk cafes, we're not looking to change uh, the roles of community boards. That would stay the same as it is uh, currently. Uh, that's charter mandated, so that would be a different process that we're not looking into. Uh, in terms of the uh, roadway seating, uh, that's a brand new process that we're starting uh, from scratch and uh, we're not looking in the permanent program to have a formal role for community boards, uh, but we would have input in terms of uh, the process going forward with developing the program before it's initiated, as well as the opportunity uh, for input uh, during annual reviews uh, for the restaurants participating in the program. Thank you for that. And what plans and resources would DOT undertake to support and deploying in underserved communities where business was, was hit hardest by COVID-19? Um, yes, so in terms of that, and I know Ben, if you wanna talk about this, I know you got into it a little bit with the presentation. Uh, we've seen that prior COVID program, those who took advantage or were able to take advantage of this program were uh, focused in you know neighborhoods that are already, you know, didn't need uh, extra help in terms of this kind of thing. And in terms of the regulations that were in place, uh, they could be confusing and a little burdensome uh, so that those created barriers to those small businesses who were trying to participate in the program. Um, we also know that the city, uh, uh, the task force on racial inclusion and equity uh, previously identified 33 communities in the city that have been hit hardest by COVID. Uh, nine of those are in Brooklyn. And uh, we know, I don't have exact numbers on those places, but as Ben got to his presentation, we've seen increased usage of uh, sidewalk cafes and roadway dining in those communities. Uh, so we think that removing zoning from the equation really opens up the possibility uh, to every community, but those communities in particular uh, to participate in the program. Um, I, if, I, if I could just add to that, yeah, you know, especially like looking at 
the map, East New York was prohibitively like barred from having sidewalk cafes. So this zoning text proposal will remove that and focus again, just on siting criteria. So we think it kind of removes a layer that will make it easier for all restaurants to participate in the program that they won't have to think about what zoning they're in or have to go through a process of requesting a, a commercial overlay rezoning to to allow a sidewalk cafe and i think what's important for why you know dot is and this city is working on rolling out a permanent open restaurants program is that we've seen a lot of restaurants sort of take advantage build infrastructure um and uh you know move to outdoor dining which we hope has you know helped their businesses so we think it's very important to to continue that and make sure they'll be able to sort of you know continue that momentum and and work with them to transition is something that will work both with community boards and their neighborhood but also still allow the flexibility of them to serve outdoors and and serve more of the community uh, thank you for that. Uh, we're also joined by my colleague, Richard Barrick, Director of Land Use. And Richard, I'll, I'll leave the field to you. You have a couple of questions. Thank you, Serena. And before I go on to questions, just want to point out that in those areas, there may be some restaurants that you find that built structures that would be pretty hard to convert to the new roles. So one form of assistance might be in terms of financial help or whatnot to help them deconstruct what may have been constructed above and beyond the rules. And the other might be in terms of helping businesses in those areas fund the external improvements to make these roadbed and sidewalk cafes is something you could think of as well for those partisan areas. Um, strong questions. Richard, uh, yeah. I, I just want to thank you for that and, I, and, and note that um, it is something the city is thinking about. The city has done some limited work through the um, a partnership between the Economic Development Corporation and uh, the AIA to offer direct technical and physical assistance to restaurants in some uh, all over the city, but also in some of the hardest hit areas. So understanding, I, I think you know we have been successful in doing that in the emergency context, and it you know I think it's your your points are well taken about what that looks like going forward. That is wonderful. Um, so go on with questions. Uh, will DOT have uniform pedestrian clearance standards or would DOT have to specify rules for wider pedestrian clearances outside of what you showed in the slides when such openings might have pertained to past environmental mitigation or otherwise mandated by zoning meant to preclude pedestrian congestion, whether it be even extending the, the sidewalk realm onto private properties by certain zoning setback requirements. Uh, so will those kind of situations be taken into consideration as well? Richard, I wanna make sure I understand the question. It is really about what is the pedestrian clearance rule likely to be and how does it respond to congestion and in, in particularly in the environmental context? So you have an eight foot and a 12 foot set up with a 50% based on really wide streets, mm -hmm. but there may be certain past public discretionary actions where as part of the EIS or part of the EAS, a certain width may have been set up for uh, clearance. And in addition, we do have occasional actions where a zoning text is introduced as part of the Euler action to say, add another 10 feet of sidewalk, even though it's on the private property. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of times they may be done to provide more pedestrian area. Although other times may simply being about pushing the building back to have more light and air at the street, even if that light and air uh, sidewalk area is used up by things such as sidewalk cafe. So just in terms of setting up yeah. where you might not have eight feet, Will those kind of past contexts uh, be taken into consideration, or is it simply this uniform 12 feet and or 50% of sidewalk? Yeah. Um, so let, let, let me respond to that. And Dash, please feel free to add. Um, I will say from the environmental context, um, our, our, uh, uh, our consultants did look at this 
and concluded that a 12 foot clearance, if it's truly clear, right? And so I want to be very careful that when we're talking about clearance, we, you know, we mean absent any obstructions, right? Well maintained 12 feet was uh, a, a, a large enough space, even in our highest density areas. So we think from, you know, from that perspective, um, we do think 12 feet is, is, is a comfortable space um, uh, to be working with. We'd certainly welcome the feedback to see where, um, you know, if there are places where, where um, you know, you feel that that's not appropriate. Of course, we were being mindful of a balance here of really not requiring an excessive amount of public space to make sure that we are actually not uh, inadvertently removing more areas of eligibility, because that was something obviously we had a, a much concern given the, you know, the actual width of sidewalks in many, in, in many conditions. So that is where we ended, uh, landed on 12 feet. It was really the minimum uh, necessary to meet the environmental conditions based on our own pedestrian analyses. A truly clear 12 feet, you know, absent all of the uh, uh, obstruction um, measurements. So to the second point, I think about how does things like sidewalk widening or other other prior actions fit in? Um, I think part of you know we we tend to think of these. I, it's sort of the same way that you were you were you were getting on your answer, which is that there are places in the city where we have asked development to create a wider sidewalk uh, for the city on private property in order to get to that that wide space. Um, once that sidewalk is built, you know, our, our, our feeling is that it shouldn't be treated any different than any other sidewalk. Um, and so, um, you know, we didn't want to create a condition where, uh, a restaurant was in fact, um, uh, penalized because of it being on a sidewalk that was built in a certain way, right? We wanted to set a standard. That we thought was appropriate for the congest the congestion levels that we have in different areas of the city, which is why we're adding that supplemental that supplemental 12 feet. Um, but we didn't want to start picking and choosing in those areas that a certain building, because of the zoning conditions it had built been built in, all of a sudden had a different responsibility for that restaurant tour, which in addition to being a bit unfair, also we, you know, could create a real enforcement problem. For the restaurants, for DOT, and for the general public, and trying to understand that a sidewalk is not a sidewalk. We wanted this to be very simple and easy to observe. That anyone could look at an area and see, you know, curb to building line. This is the requirement of of open space that that restaurant has to be behaving by. So the key phrase is curb to building line. So it's the combination of public and private realm of sidewalk. Yeah, and, and I think as we work with DOT to build a, a future application portal and, and the materials, you know, where we're really trying to make this more transparent and easier than the old program, I think that's something we're really thinking about is like, how, how can you as a general, you know, citizen walk down the street and if you see a violation, if you see a clear path being blocked, that you would actually understand that in some basic way, right? And so if you start thinking about these additional calculations, that could really muddy the waters there. We want that to be as clear and as transparent as possible. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, when would there be an opportunity to comment on the DOT rulemaking? Um, so we're still working on drafting and designing uh, those standards now. Uh, so when we're complete with that, we're looking to come back either uh, in the form of coming back to the borough board or individual community boards. And we're looking to do that uh, next year, 2022. Uh, thank you. And last question, uh, given that many restaurants operate with seasonally open facades, which contradicts the photograph that was in a presentation where it was more of like a walk-up window. Why is the proposed zoning restrictions uh, restricting such openings to serve customers uh, to be outside the building as opposed to uh, where you have customers sitting inside the building yet uh, they wanna be outdoors in essence by having uh, the, the walls of the building opened up and you do see many restaurants that either have garage doors, sliding doors, or um, very high window openings where, where 
there's no glazing. It's just you are technically having the same air as the outside air, yet the way I read the resolution, it seems like it's very consistent with that photograph in the presentation where it was more meant the server getting outside to the outer tables or the server taking the order, handing the order through the open window, but not about the tables that are inside the restaurants. If you could talk about that. Thank you, Richard. And I th let's follow up on this one specifically with the text. Um, uh, we'd be happy to look at this. I think uh, it's absolutely not our intention to be precluding things that are already legal. Um, it is, uh, we, we thought the test text was drafted in such a way uh, to be um, really confirming and assuring that uh, the take that the operable window provisions were not standing in the way of uh, of connecting to your outdoor cafe. So let's be sure that it is in fact achieving that intent. It's certainly not the intent to be blocking from a garage door window. Um, the concern again, just for for those who aren't close to it, uh, the text was attempting to deal with uh, certain provisions that would preclude an indoor restaurant and an outdoor restaurant being attached by an operable takeout window. Um, so that's that's the intent here. If 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 we've, we haven't captured it right, we should certainly look at that provision a little more closely. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it, it, we understand that the way the text was drafted helps the whole evolution of outdoor operation, whether it be walk up or table sitting out there. But looking at the restaurant industry in a larger sense, since many restaurants, five, 10% of them have these walls that are not solid. Is this the opportunity to try to address the larger issue and go a little bit beyond the open streets? Apologies, my mute button got stuck for a moment. Um, we'd certainly welcome your, your feedback on, 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 on what issues um, you think we should be addressing here. I think overall, we were trying to be mindful of staying within the scope of things that were enabling the open restaurants program. Uh, but we, you know, we welcome that feedback. Yeah, I, and if you could confirm with perhaps Department of Buildings before the borough board takes us up on a vote to clarify what they deem as a fully enclosed business in terms of restaurant operation. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Serana. Yes, with Serana, that's... Teresa Scavo, could you ask your question again, the first one, as to what the community board's involvement will be? Uh, yeah, so the question I had was, um, what role will the community board be given in terms of future development of design and operational standards? That was the question. Okay. Des, you want to answer it again or? Sure. Um, I think uh, so. so. Oh, go ahead. No, my understanding was that the role was not changing, but you could go ahead. There right. No so in terms of the sidewalk cafe uh, approvals, that role wouldn't change with community boards. Uh, that is charter mandated and we're not looking to uh, do a charter revision with this. Uh, in terms of the uh, roadway dining, that's a new program and a new process. Uh, so we're not uh, looking to have individual uh, applications reviewed by community boards, uh, but we will have opportunities for community board input uh, in terms of developing the process and in terms of uh, input when we do the reviews uh, for the applications and in terms of um, the an annual review of those applications. So, in other words, community boards will still have involvement with sidewalk cafes, but roadway, we have no input. Uh, the, the sidewalk cafe input is formal. And uh, the roadway cafe it would be different, would be informal. And and I just want to underscore the other point with Dash said, which is in terms of the development of the rules, which will ultimately cultivate in a CAPA process sometime next year, that CAPA process requires a public review as well. And I think I heard, you know, Dash, uh, you know, just confirm 
the, you know, the expectation is that community boards will be, you know, part of that review process as well, leading up to and including the CAPA review of the actual rules. So right. commu the community boards will be involved in the setup of that process in addition to the ongoing reviews. Thank you. And as the floor is open up to members, community board 17, you have a question? I do indeed. Uh, thank you for presenting this. I do uh, have a question regarding something very specific around um, the specific requirements to maintain cleanliness for the cafes that are under the overpass. Uh, I think you cut off Joan. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you yeah. now. Okay, so my question was around the cafes that will be under the overpass. Since we were essentially deregulating how um, this is being managed, how do we guarantee cleanliness for restaurants that will be that are situated and will have outdoor cafes under the overpass? Um, so that's uh, oh, go ahead. No, I, I just clarify. I, I assume you're 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 concerned about like dust and and. Uh, and dust and, and debris, debris. Um, as the trains go by, anything could be tossed out or or it's just I don't I don't I can't envision how this will uh, make because, of course, you know, board of uh, the health department has specific guidelines for these restaurants. Yeah. So how do we guarantee that yeah. they will not then be penalized for debris that happened to have fallen during a particularly um, vibrant train passage so so i th i think one, one thing i noticed i think the, the the concern about cleanliness um well well i think your your point is well taken it certainly extends to to cafes beyond under the overpass right we have we have issues with cleanliness with outdoor restaurants throughout the city and certainly you know we have been hearing you know from communities that that is a really critical concern about the future program right um about um you know, the, uh, not encouraging proliferation of rats and making sure the setups are clean and that we, you know, that the streets are able to be cleaned. Um, so we're, I think we're mindful of that in, 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 in all of the circumstances. Um, it's one of the reasons that DOH has been a really key part of the team that's, that's um, been supporting the work that we're all doing and that we've continued to talk to them about rules that might be appropriate for the, for the ongoing program. They are very, um, you know, obviously they are already very concerned about um, cleanliness and enforcing cleanliness. They have not raised to us any specific concerns about elevateds, um, you know, in those areas being, you know, more, um, you know, uh, prone to violations on, on, on their part than any other restaurants. But they're certainly working to make sure that any rules that are, you know, that are needed, um, you know, are part of the program, um, you know, this this particular one having not been raised as a critical issue, I think you know we can certainly you know take that back and, and talk to them more specifically about whether there are um, specific elevated issues they would want to recommend. I can certainly think about you know awnings and umbrellas and things like that might be more appropriate in some of those circumstances. But in general, they're a part of the team that's building the rules and will have every opportunity to both. Um, message the health rules with the cafe rules as well as build in additional operational requirements that might be beneficial um, to to ensuring that 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 continued cleanliness. Uh, Dash, anything then, you want to add to that? Thank you. This is so my final piece, my final piece aren't of this though. Limitations I'm sorry. Uh, for sidewalk cafes under an overpass, doesn't that exist under current zoning or am, am I mistaken about that? Um, can you state your name for the record? CB10. Community Board 10. Oh, I'm sorry. Lori Willis, Community Board 10. Under current zoning, aren't there restrictions for sidewalk cafes under, uh, you know, a train trestle overpass? I thought that did there exist are. currently because of safety concerns. Again, yes, there, there are prohibitions under elevated. So that's one of the things the text amendment is looking to redress. Um, I, I, whether it's about safety or cleanliness or um, you know, the, the, uh, aesthetics of the street, um, you know, I, I, those are, uh, the, the rationales for those prohibitions are somewhat lost to time. Okay. Community board, um, 11 CB 11. You have a question. No, uh, community board 9. 
Uh, yes. Uh, Fred Baptiste, Chair Committee Board 9. Uh, I, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm a little bit clearer of myself as well. So, with respect, what, I guess, first of all, what are we talking about of the net increase in sidewalk um, establishment? So, if we're talking about before and we're talking about after, what's the net difference in terms of what are we looking at? Um, you're on mute, if, Caroline. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, taking my time to come off mute because it's 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 a very valid question, but it's a very hard one to answer because ultimately, what restaurants choose to stay part of the program in the future um, is a little bit difficult to estimate, right? So what we're really doing is trying to get um, zoning out of the way to potentially allow restaurants to participate. Once they are potentially able to participate, then the, then the question will be, does their siting and their sidewalk actually allow it? Um, and then whether they are willing to both pay the cost and also go through what will be a much more considerably lengthy process to actually get approved into a future program, right? So today, you know, we have a program that's both free and effectively, you know, and self-certified. So you go to a website, you press a few buttons, you're ultimately in. Even if maybe you weren't, you know, completely honest on how much sidewalk clear space you had in the future, you're going to pay a fee and you're going to have DOT in, you know, inspecting your diagrams to really ensure you've done everything right. And then you'll have the community boards reviewing it and then you might have the city council reviewing it. So it's very difficult to say exactly how many restaurants will actually avail themselves of that opportunity. We certainly hope. You know, and our expectation is that it will be more than the 200 or so cafes that we had in Brooklyn prior to the pandemic, but it will be considerably less than I think the 2000 that we currently have in Brooklyn. So, you know, let's, let, let's split the difference and say, we think it'll be a couple hundred, you know, um, you know, would be, you know, I think a, a, a hopeful outcome, but again, it's very, it's very hard to say with all of those still in flux. Uh, community board 14 for. One, then three in that order. Hi, thank you. Joanne Brown, Community Board 14. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. Um, firstly, when do you expect to have the Roadway Cafe presentation for us? Um, I think Caroline might have more on that, uh, but I, I would say in um, uh, sometime in 2022, right, Caroline? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to make sure you were speaking to it because it'll certainly be DOT making that presentation. But that's my understanding as well is that it, that we're really looking at um, 2021 being focused on the 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 specifics of the sidewalk cafe text and the um, uh, initial phases of of council action, uh, and that will that 2022 is more likely for the um, the specifics on roadways, but again, I would say that there, you know, there may be updates in between. So, um, uh, that's, you know, that's not to say that the community boards wouldn't hear anything in, in the, in those interim times. Um, but certainly that the, um, Kappa is not expected until well into 2022. Um, CB4. Is that, uh, you have uh, another question? Yeah, Go ahead. Go a ahead. Question and a comment. Um, so I'm curious in, in the future rules when in 2022, when this is rolled out as a permanent program. Um, in self certification, are you going to require the building landlord approval for a sidewalk cafe or if you know in effect now for a roadway cafe? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? So, when you, when you roll this out to a permanent program and you have the restaurant self certify, are you going to require the building, the landlord of the building, to sign off that they give approval for a sidewalk cafe or a roadway cafe? Hi, Joanne. I, I think I could take a start at that question. So it, the future program will not be self-certify. Only the emergency program right now is self-certify. So in the future, to have a sidewalk cafe, you would have to you'd have to apply to DOT and they'll they'll be the public review process will will happen again as it did pre-COVID. I think what prevents um you know, I believe building owners can have in their lease terms uh, whether a restaurant could have a sidewalk cafe or not. So a restaurant would be allowed to apply, like zoning wouldn't be a requirement anymore. But I, I think this negotiation between a building owner and a 
restaurant owner could be in the in the lease terms. Okay, thank you. And then and lastly, just a comment. You know, while we really appreciate being part of the rulemaking process, especially for the Roadway Cafe um, initiative, um, rules are only as good as enforcement. So I, I just want to bring that to the table. Uh, you know, community boards have a real um, nuanced sense of what goes on in our streets and our roadbeds, and we should be part of the process of certifying each site. Thanks a lot. Thank you for that. And community board four, Ms. Camacho. Hi, yes, hi, it's uh, Camacho. Uh, I have a, a two concern. Uh, says, uh, you said Bushwick is a big borough. Every borough is different in its own ways. Uh, uh, DOT is not doing their due diligence in regards to some of these places that are illegal and look horrendous and garbage all over the place. I've seen people eating with the garbage next to there. So I don't know how you guys are, are trying to make this. Uh, we have residents on top. We have a place on Myrtle Avenue that they got pigeons flying all over those cafes and crap all over the place. So I don't know how you guys are going to do this. Well, how is it going to work? Uh, uh, this is not a Williamsburg where it's old manufacturers and we have people that actually live. Are people, is there going to be a time frame where they're going to stop serving outside of food or and drinks? Because we have a lot of problems with people eating and drinking and hanging out outside and party because the people that party here don't aren't the people that live here. You know, they come out. They do the dirty deed in my community and then get back on the train and leave. And the people that are applying for these permits, uh, the people that are there don't live in this community. If you were to, we do the statistic, I can show you very much that the people that are opening are investing to make money. So they're not looking out for my community because I lived in my block for 60 years and I can't get a, a, a commercial permit to park my car. But yet you can give it to city bike. You could give it to all these places, but you can't give it to me to park my place here and pay a little extra in my tax for me. But yet I clean 18 inches over the curb. I do the snow and if someone falls, I got to go to court to measure if it was on my side or their side. But DOT is not doing that to us. We're sick and tired of city agencies coming in here and throwing things and making it look good. Those pictures look wonderful wherever you took them. Come to Bushwick, I'll show you beautiful pictures that don't look like that. That is closed off, it's covert. You're all, it's supposed to be open air when people, this, some of these places are closed off. I don't know how you guys gonna supervise and make sure that it's being done. Two, is there gonna be a time frame where the stores and the restaurants are gonna close because people live on top. They don't wanna hear that noise in the book because they go to work the next day. Are you gonna, is there a time that they're gonna close off? Why are you changing the zone? Some areas you can change it, some areas you can't. So let's say Bushwick doesn't want it, let's not change that zoning because we wanted a BCP plan, zone Bushwick completely and your mayor, not me, cause I didn't vote for him, said no. So we really need to find out who is the people that live here, part of this community, or not, or you're catering to the status quo that want these permits that you can guys make money to. So you need to answer those two questions because you're gonna have a nice presentation in my board and I'm gonna be the first one ripping you guys up. So you guys need to address issues now that's happening now. That's garbage all over this place that can't control. Go to Jefferson. Go to Troutman, so go to Nickelback. You, you have two you questions. Need to those questions and find out one, are they going to cater to the people in the community or are they catering to the restaurant? Two, are you going to close at a certain time? Is it going to be measured? You're going to have all these closed environments. It's COVID. You used it. Why are you closing things down? Why are they being closed? So, so I don't understand that one. You guys have those two questions? Can you so uh, let, uh, let me answer the, the 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 easy one, which is yes, the proposal for the permanent program is to keep the hours of operation consistent with the old sidewalk cafe program. So there okay, will be so hours of it? operations. Uh, I believe it's midnight uh, on weekdays and one a.m. on 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 weekends. Um, but everybody is, don't leave. Everybody don't leave at one. Shit don't start happening until after four. I'm keeping yeah. it real because that's so, what's happening. 
so let me try. I, I, I certainly, I just want to just say, you know, I appreciate, you know, and, and, and at our, our prior community board meeting, I know you, you know, also expressed a lot of these concerns and, and we share them and, and. There is a real challenge, um, you know, in, in, in talking about a future permanent program where our goal is really to put back in place a lot of, you know, checks and regulations and enforcement in a time when we're still in the emergency condition. So certainly I want to just highlight again with regards to the enclosures that a lot of those are already breaking the rules um, and that the city, you know, has really been in a, in a, in a, in a trying to walk a fine line between enforcement and also not shutting down restaurants in a time where it's, it's, it, we're in an extraordinarily difficult uh, question, economic condition. So I it, understand that. my question is why not address these issues first before yeah. they come up, before you create more, you know what you guys got, you're doing too much in one group. Let's finish fixing this problem that we have now to address this issue before we add more problems later on. Cause that's what you're doing. You're putting a bandage on something and you can't be, I don't know who, where you guys get your rocket scientists. You need to be out here in the field. You gotta stop being in the computer because you're not seeing what we're seeing and what we're feeling. I'm talking to you on how I feel and what we, this community is feeling and the situation that's going on. We got more rats, we got more garbage, we got more stuff and the people that are coming outside are dropping it off here. So we need to address those issues first now. You know that they need to do it and don't have, we need okay. to fix the problem that's happening now before we add more yeah. stuff, 2022. Yeah. We need to fix oh. now. Not let's not let's not reinvent the wheel. There's a problem now. So, and the problem is you guys created it without coming to the communities and addressing and addressing the community at large. So you guys need to fix something. Something needs to be done. We can't keep chatting, changing amendments, changing zoning when you didn't fix what's going on now. You know that there's people doing it illegal. You know that there's pros off I can thank you twenty or thirty of them. So how are you adding more so stuff? I don't want to. Camacho, I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to let you finish your last statement. I wrap. You know, if you have anything else to add, I want to. No, get to I don't have anything else. They know what's going on. Whoever's getting the money, or a fearless mayor, or whoever's doing it, needs to know. They're not coming to Bushwick and push us out. We've been here. We're not going anywhere. So you need to work with the community at large. And that's not what DOT. That's not what DOT and none of the city agencies are doing. We're going to have budget consultation. I'm just referring to all this community board. We need to step up and start re representing our community the way we're supposed to and cut this politic out because we're hurting. Thank you for your, your, your comments, Mr. Camacho. Okay, um, duly noted. Uh, can we have community board one, a representative, uh, state your name and, and title. Then we're going to go to CB3. I see 17 has some couple of questions in the chat. Then we're going to open up to the public. So CB1, I believe, um, not Ms. Fuller, but uh, is it one of our the outreach committee members? I have a question. He's, he's, on the board. he's a board member and he's the chairperson of outreach. Santa Michele, if you were calling, uh, I wasn't sure if you're calling me. I send the, one, the, the community board three. Yeah, I'm Santa Michele. I'm the chair of the outreach committee, uh, committee board one. Uh, I have to say I I'm in tune with the passion of uh, our uh, fellow Bushwick uh, uh, board member, and I found this really predatory. I said that the community board one, when city planning came to do a presentation, it is predatory, and I have a list of uh, uh, criticism and question. Uh, they got together really. I I also represent uh, uh, the Greenpoint Coalition, which under its umbrella there are several block associations in the Greenpoint Historic District and other residents are uh, not formally represented by uh, organization on their blocks. And, and they've been huge concern. Uh, it's not only about trash, but uh, something as city planning and DOT they're not talking about. And, uh, and I've been attending meeting at the SLA uh, committee meeting until midnight at 1 a.m. because we have another proliferation of liquor license. So while, yes, there was a pandemic and the community has been very supportive of the structure and of course a broad impact on quality of life, that has created an increase at proliferation of liquor license. There is no control on the 500 foot rules 
And, and I wish this could be something, it's a question, but also an input. I wish we could combine. So the 500 foot rule was meant to limit the number of licenses and maintain a retail diversity. We have lost retail diversity. In Greenpoint on Franklin, within a, a block and a half, we had like 15 liquor licenses. Today, there are other four that I saw uh, the, the committee notice uh, uh, today. I mean, it's amazing. Every month, four within three blocks. That's why, let me tell you why, because with this predatory legislation and with the request for this change of zoning regulation and this text amendment, what you are doing, you are actually giving a possibility to that small retail storefront, uh, 200 square feet, to expand the footprint, to go on the street where community has not to have any input. So you disregard decades of work on quality of life the community has done. You completely are doing that and you disregard the fact that like Greenpoint Historic District has a commercial overlay. It means that historically, maybe it was a store were closing eight o'clock. Now you would call it restaurant. The reality is a bar. They are bar that provide food because the trend has changed globally. We eat and we drink. And now how do you measure sound? All the rules, all the law were in place. They were able to contain. Now you cannot measure sound outside and the predominantly residential with a commercial overlay it means that 99% of the resident, this is my community, has 50 people sitting on a structure outside the window. My wife is the director of a school. She has been a first responder. Three people are dying in school. She get up at five o'clock in the morning, come back at 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. she crashed to bed. My neighbor, she's a critical care nurse. My two friends, a couple also here, critical care doctor, one of the Montefiore in the Bronx. They have a, and you have this structure outside, they have impact on quality of life. 50 people talking outside, they produce sounds. Now, are, we going, are you going to consider that commercial overlay may not qualify because uh, you show a map with a blue uh, highlighted area, but what about the commercial overlay? Zoning regulation should get into certain specific and recognize that if there is a predominantly residential area with a commercial overlay, maybe a bar could happen, maybe a structure outside could happen because above them, they are full story of people living there, family, children. That's and they have to. Okay. So uh, the, the question that, that was in there, can you repeat your question? Uh, yeah, the question was on commercial overlay. Are you going to get into detail all the, and maybe adding additional rule where maybe where there are commercial overlay, especially on a Greenpoint historic district? I'm making an example. This is the community I know very well. I'm sure there are other in the West Village of Manhattan. I've been attending other meetings. Mm -hmm. The question is, are you going to maybe exclude because it's predominantly residential? The commercial overlay was done a while ago, was meant to create diversity. You actually kill in diversity. It's a mono industry. That's why I said it's predatory. It's a mono industry. Would the bars and the restaurants. Do you, do you have the question? Sure. And you, yeah. sure, sure. I think the question is, are we going to look at prohibiting uh, uh, cafes on commercial streets? And the short answer is no, we're not. Um, they were allowed pre-COVID and we're certainly looking to continue that. But I think I'll, I want to also just respond to a little bit of the, 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 the broader legitimate concerns about both, I think, you know, really difficult times during enforcement of the existing situation and concern about how that will go, you know, go on in, in, in the future and how we deal with all of these quality of life issues. I think, you know, part of the reason we really share the desire to leave the emergency condition behind and transition into a more regulated program again is so that we have better control over exactly these kinds of issues, right? The pre COVID sidewalk cafe program, which will predominantly be going back into place, I think really did give a modicum of control, both to community boards and to the city to really deal with a lot of quality of life issues. And that's why it's really important that a lot of those structures get put back in place like the noise rules, like our ability to, you know, pull a license away when, when, it, when, um, when structures are out of compliance. And so, you know, I just would be mindful of those and, and, and the opportunity to put a lot of those rules and structures back in place as part of the teeth that will allow us to actually handle those, um, those issues just as we were able to handle them in a pre-COVID condition. 
Okay, thank you for that. And just to note that community board four and one, their neighbor and district. So um, that that concern be noted. Um, we're going to move on to community board three. But and the answer uh, we didn't receive an answer because first uh, the the road uh, uh, structure or the road occupation uh, is, is practically is outside. We're talking about the sidewalk, and that's an issue. And uh, and the answer about the commercial overlay means is that the zoning is predominantly residential. It means that ninety nine percent of the people sleeps there at a certain point. I didn't receive an answer, and I have major concern as I, a board member and I, I, and from the community uh, at large. But this is this is only a presentation, but there will be uh, recommendations at the end of this. At the end, uh, Madam Chair, if possible. Okay, uh, this is only a presentation. Um, so when we open our meeting, there would be recommendations at the end of this. So when this meeting is uh, when this meeting is over, this item is going to go to individual boards for them to come and present for the boards to take up. In addition to that, there'll be a public hearing for October the fifth, and uh, and then a uh, possible draft of, of a re resolution. So this is just for them to present. Is, is it possible that we can make a recommendation of all the boards that are, are are present at this time to that this situation right now? All the communities at large that are here, fifty nine, which I think we can make a request that this be dead on arrival and not push forward anymore. I'm making a recommendation. And if any of our board members, and I think it's under Robert Rules of Order, can uh, assess to that when it comes to recommendation, we can dead this instead of them carrying on this foolishness that they're doing and, and putting the wool over our eyes. Thank you. So I have make a recommendation. I don't know if we can do it when we're opening our meetings. I think we can. We're presenting at the moment. And once again, we have to go back and take official quorum and road call for the board members okay. before we're able to Thank take any vote. In addition to that, this is only a presentation. But as you noted, your, your, your more remarks will be included so we could follow up accordingly. So we'll make sure. So we'll make sure. Chair, I, think, I think, Madam Chair, just for the point of order, just to make sure that if we do at the end of our meeting, when we open up our meeting after the presentation, if there's any recommendation, we should be on sorry. the agenda that, that we, if we can make. Um, this this item is not scheduled for a vote, but when we come back, but we, we can debt it before it comes. There's nothing that says that we can't debt it through all the boards. We can put it up in the air. Elected officials do it all the time. Ma Madam Chair, I actually have an inquiry because I thought I saw during we have a story during one of the hearing before we could make a recommendation. Second. Give me one second. Oh, I so, know. I just want to hear the. I, I just want to make. Just listen to the presentation. When the board opens up the meeting, I'm just inquiring, is there any way during that portion we can make recommendations? That's all I'm saying. This whole presentation is for us to kind of make recommendations and, and, and hear this proposal, right? So I'm gonna let Richard take the floor. Mr. Kamar, I'll make sure I get back to you. Then I'm gonna turn it over. I know community board three had a question or concern. I'd like to get to, I'd like to, get to, um, to Richard and then CB9. So Richard, Okay, so Richard Flateau or Birak? I'm sorry, Barrack. He had like he was, okay. And then, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Camacho. Go ahead, Richard. You could take from the community board uh, members first before I uh, add in a comment. Okay, and community board three before nine, and then I have to get back to some questions in the chat. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, Department of Transportation and DCP. Richard Flateau, Community Board 3. So I think you've heard through uh, passionate remarks and questions, a common thread of concerns about quality of life issues. So I have another one, which um, hasn't come up yet, but um, in Board 3 in Bedford-Stuyvesant, there's always uh, challenges about parking, which have gotten worse during COVID. So um, has city planning looked at what the impact of this proposal would be on parking and what's the impact? What's the impact now and what would you anticipate the impact to be on parking? How many spaces would be taken out? Well, let me answer the easy part, which is that the text amendment has zero effect on parking because the text amendment is only dealing with the sidewalk cafes. So at this point in time, 
we're not there's no there's no recommendation the board is not at being asked to act on the roadway portion those were really again really conceptual and preliminary information so in terms of the actual action there is no effect on parking um dash do you want to comment on the roadway side uh sure on the roadway side it's something we're taking a look at especially with um issues of uh freight in terms of deliveries uh, to both restaurants and other businesses uh, but it's one factor in the plan. We're looking at a lot of competing uses for the street, uh, you know, whether it's uh, buses, whether it's bikes, uh, whether it's this roadway dining program, uh, driving lanes, parking lanes. So we, in everything we're doing with this, we're trying to balance all of those needs. Okay, so you don't have a number at this point. No. Okay, one other question um, or comment. I've noticed in um, Bedford-Stuyvesant, there's several sidewalk cafes or um, roadway uh, cafes that are uh, constructed but aren't used at all. Is there anything that we could do about that? Where there's no use and they're, you know, they're just taking up space. Right, uh, so in terms of those, all of the roadway seating uh, that's put in has to be used and occupied uh, not only within 30 days of the authorization of it coming in right now in the temporary program, uh, but if it's unused and unoccupied for any 30 day period, um, then we can deem it abandoned and the restaurant has to have it removed. Uh, so in terms of those, and I know it's, uh, this has come up in other community boards and the way they've handled it from the meetings is they've asked folks to uh, send it to the DM or the chair uh, to then send uh, to our office, the Borough Commissioner's office at DOT. Uh, but folks can also individually make 311 complaints, and those will uh, get routed to our inspection teams. Thank you. And then we, uh, Fred and then Joan, uh, Community Board 17. So, Fred, you had a comment, and then I'm going to go through some of the chat. For Joan, you have a couple of questions some of the other members have. Thank you so very not. much, Madam Chair. Yeah, so very quickly, I think uh, I definitely would say I have concerns when we're talking about releasing the floodgate um, and allowing that to happen. I mean, I think that definitely in an emergency situation such as COVID, yeah, it was warranted. And I, I think we needed to give our businesses that lifeline. Uh, to say that we make it a part of a permanent landscape, I, I'm not sure we're at that stage. Uh, I, I think that the boards especially serve that 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 function in terms of being able to advise what makes sense in the community, what fits, um, to what level it's appropriate. Um, so I hesitate in terms of when that comes up. But in terms of a, a question I do have uh, with, in terms of procedure, I did see one of the slides where there was a deadline established for community board input for September 27th. Um, and I have concerns with that because I think I saw elsewhere that there was a process that had started on June 27th. Uh, and this is something that has been an issue with a number of different city agencies where I don't, un I don't understand where they expect to have. Uh, I'm sorry, sir, can you repeat that? I missed it. You said there was, um, I was right. And there was a process. One of the processes had started on June 26th, on June 27th, June 27th or something to that effect. And I have an issue with that because I don't understand how you open a public review process when a big um, part of that public review, which happens at community boards, shuts down over the summer. So if there is a 90 day review process, we lost 60 right off the bat just because of the timing of this, uh, which I think is, is, is really uh, probably nice about it. Um, it it's disappointing, uh, but I have other words that I'd rather say about that. I think if we're really being honest about it and we're trying to make sure this is a process that is vetted, that is that you have proper input, we need to make sure that that's one of those things we put on the calendar. So to have a, 20, uh, a September 27th uh, deadline in which community board input is really kind of formally ended and the process goes on and a number, good number of the boards don't have an opportunity to actually uh, chew on this, get community input, get board input, get committees, get a formal board recommendation. Uh, I think is a disservice to the entire community. And I, and I, but, and I, but if, but, Mr. Camacho, before but if you I get that clarity, what happens at the 27th? What, 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 which part of the process is ending at the 27th and what happens after that? 
Sure. So let me say again, the, the text amendment component, which I, I'm not sure if you missed the earlier presentation or, or, or not, but the text amendment, which is really specifically limited to allowing cafes to potentially enter the program in areas where zoning had prohibited them. That text amendment was certified into public review in June. Uh, and so the community board and borough board referral period consistent with, you know, all of the, you know, typical DCP guidelines, um, you know, went through, it goes through that September 27th date specifically for that text amendment. So the text amendment will have a public hearing at city planning commission in October, uh, um, where we'll, where there's another chance to, you know, be part of the public hearing and, and, and review process. The expectation that city planning acts on um, the text amendment uh, by November. I want to be mindful that this schedule was in part because we've been asked by the city council to move very quickly on um, the elements for the public uh, the, for the permanent program here. So, um, you know, the, the, the expectation of moving uh, in this administration and in this city council, we're coming from from, you know, from above uh, with, uh, as well as the speed of recovery, right? This all takes a very, very long time. The text amendment, as we pointed out, is really the only the first of many legal steps here that are going to stretch for multiple year process. So if we have any hope of getting out of the emergency program and being able to stand up a future, better regulated permanent program, invite restaurants into that application, actually review the restaurants, which you will all have to do, uh, and then ultimately have a future program. This really is a multi year process, which is really what's guiding that that timeline as well. So, again, just the specific answer, September 27th is the deadline. The, 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 the official deadline for the text amendment review for community boards. Uh, I will say there are a number of boards that have told us that they you know, would like to look at this in early October. City planning will always hear any recommendations we, we have as long as it's still under our review. So. Um, you know, for a board that, you know, can't quite meet that deadline, but wants to submit it a week or too late, we will always honor the, the information we, we receive. Mr. Camacho, I'm going to actually just hold on your comment. I just want to give community board, I'll let you comment. I just want to give community board eight a chance to have a, they have a question. Community board eight. Yes. yes. Okay. Your name for the record. I, I believe yes. This is, yes. Yes. This is Irsa Weatherspoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I, I heard already about uh, the thoughts of parking. That's also an issue for Crown Heights. Not everybody can get on a bicycle or even have the convenience of a bus. We have elderly people to consider. There are other businesses in the area that um, are outside of restaurants that are going to be affected where, you know, people need to perhaps drive to get to, to their locations and camp now. So, it really creates some sort of hardship in that area. On the other hand, too, um, we also have uh, a lot of city dock, city bike docks, on sidewalks, in the roadways, and you know, when I think about a street like Nostrand Avenue, that corridor is so narrow with the bus routes, the, the delivery trucks, the emergency vehicles. I really think that as you discuss and mull around how you're going to address that you keep that in mind that uh, every shoe doesn't fit and it, it, it can't be a broad brush when you're talking about various needs and and footprints of, of streets in different communities uh, so I, I just really wanted to to also also in addition mention roadway uh, dining seating now it was mentioned earlier by dash that the, the uh, building owner and the restaurant owner could definitely negotiate something in their lease in terms of uh, permission to use a sidewalk. But now we have the roadway. What do we do with restaurants who really just have a, 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 a purchase and go service? Uh, they don't have uh, many places inside their place to sit down but there's a, you, you're, you're using two corners because your place is on a corner. How do you address something like that? I think that's a violation um, in a lot of ways in the neighborhood. Uh, using space that you just don't even have in your own establishment and now you are exposed on two corners. That's my comment and, and, and also a question in there. 
Uh, uh, did, you, did it present a question? You need to again? I'm sorry. You said, did you uh, get the question in? Yeah, well, okay, so maybe I wasn't clear. I'm sorry about that. But in, in, what do you do with even that uh, uh, that small, small restaurant that only has a few seats inside, but they've now taken up two corners of the, of the uh, street, not even the sidewalk. They're in a roadway at this point. How, how is that addressed? How, how is an establishment able to do that? So uh, I'm happy to start and, and, and hand over to you, Dash. And, and first, let me say thank you for your service. I'm a Crown Heights resident uh, for a long time. So I um, really appreciate everything the community board uh, does. Um, you know, I think actually in Crown Heights, there are a number of really good examples of, of a restaurant, uh, you know, that's not on a, you know, on a Franklin Avenue or, you know, on a really busy street. But where we see them by themselves on a corner, um, and where actually some of those have, I think, struck the right balance, right? Where we've seen activation of a, of, a, of a street, but at a, at a level that's actually more reasonable, um, you know, than 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 when we've seen, you know, I think, uh, you know, streets where there's maybe four and five restaurants where you really do have some cumulative challenges. So, you know, you know, my my my. Um, my prejudices aside, but I, you know, I, I say that to say, you know, we do think that those are some of the success stories here as well. But in terms of the specific um, spatial elements of a corner site, right? So, um, first of all, on the sidewalk, I think we're very concerned about blockage of the of the intersection itself. We want to make sure, just like with the clear path, that there's you know the pedestrians can path. We also want to make sure people can access the curb cut and the and the corners, right? We're very, very concerned with mobility impaired um, uh, residents being able to not be impeded by by restaurant access, and that's especially important at the corners, um, where, where you know um, to have that that access um, on the um, so. And, and again, I just want to make that big distinguishing point about all we're you know that the sidewalk cafe program is much more detailed at this point because that is what we're acting on the roadway many of these are still really being worked out because this is a totally new program and so as the rules are being written a lot of these interfaces are being you know continue to work out and the community boards will have that opportunity to 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 um to really you know to take this feedback and then continue to build these rules but that all being said with the roadways i think there is a lot of concern about the um, proximity of restaurants to the intersection, um, uh, particularly for you know emergency access uh, and cars turning. So I think there's a lot of talk. Uh, the rules are that you have to be set back from the intersection. Again, enforcement has not been great on this. We've seen a lot of cheaters, um, but I think really strengthening those rules and making sure that the that the intersections are relatively clear on both the sidewalk and roadway side is certainly something that the agencies are looking at. Um, Dash, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I think you uh, covered everything. Thanks, Carolyn. All Thank right. you. Um, and as you know, as this Madam uh, Chair, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I was going to attend. I do have one quick question just for Dash. Mm -hmm. um, Dash, hi again. Um, we've, I've been in many presentations with you and I thank you for all uh, the information you're getting out there. Um, one thing that you mentioned this time that I hadn't heard previously um, was there is going to be an annual review um, for restaurants that participate. Um, previously, I recall that these were going, the uh, anticipation was that there would be four, a four year permit given for a roadway dining. So my question is, um, what would this annual review look like? Is this solely a DOT review of the structure or is it more broad than that? What are you looking for in the review? Um, and if it doesn't pass review, what happens and who does it? Right. Um, so just to clarify, uh, it, it, we're currently are planning for a four year license, uh, but the four year license would come with an annual review and that annual review uh, would be done by DOT, but it would involve input from other agencies. So like Ben and Carolyn were saying before, uh, with updated uh, health department guidelines, it would take into account uh, those uh, inspections, it would take into account DOT inspections, which would either be proactive or complaint driven, uh, and it would take in uh, other complaints and input uh, from elected officials, from community boards, and and others. So it, 
four year license, but with an annual review period uh, to see if everything with that institution was behaving properly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Savannah, for that. Can, Savannah, can he tell us who the other agencies will be in the, uh, involved in the process of the review and what and what are their responsibilities and their duties? Okay, and that's from community board one. I'm sorry, the aisle is full of community board one. Right, uh, so I don't have full details on that, but it would involve multiple agencies. So, like I was saying, Department of Health, it would also be um, uh, sanitation. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure from there, but uh, we'll, that's something that we would have more fleshed out uh, as we uh, develop those permanent guidelines with those agencies. Who will, be the lead, who, who will be the lead agency in enforcing enforcement? It would be DOT. Uh, okay. CB17, you have a number of questions in the chat, and I know you were finishing up your questions when you started off earlier, so I'll get the floor back to you before we open it up to the public, and I have Mr. Camacho give a comment. Everybody, if you wanted to. CB17, do you still want to? I could, I could go to the Sure. Chat. Well, some of my questions have already been addressed, okay. um, but I, I did wanted to add the piece around just qualifying um, that we have indeed had a conversation uh, about well with the, the health department regarding fines for for certain areas because what, what tends to happen is that in certain areas enforcement is is an, an actual thing uh, while in others it it actually is not so I just wanted to to, to restate that that concern as well um, I kind of lost sight of of all of my questions but I want to amplify uh, Mr Camacho's point and Miss um, Brown's point around and making sure that community board is included in the conversations, in the oversight, in the review, um, because as, as she so eloquently stated, we are the ones with our with, with our ear to the ground and who have our community's best interests at heart. We're, we're, we're noted as representatives. So I just wanted to make sure that that was positioned there. Um, uh, one second, I just wanna make sure, oh, I'm just gonna go back to my notes to see if my questions have indeed been responded to uh, around the prohibited spaces. That's the piece for me that has the most concern because for example, the under the overpasses, the, 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 the areas that have, that were listed as special areas to begin with, you know, that, you know, what exactly is in position to make sure that those considerations are not just ignored as we position uh, this 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 potential fix. Okay. And before I, oh, that was a question. That was a question. Yes, ma'am. So I wonder if you might um, just clarify what considerations you you you're worried won't be considered. So we talked about the the twelve foot space. We talked about what exists now where there should have been 12 foot spaces that were get, that were created on the block. Right now, there, there's a particular, I'm trying to remember which exact community that it was in because it was, there are a couple of communities in Brooklyn that I've been, that I've walked through where I couldn't even navigate the sidewalk. Because between yeah. the, the cafe and just like Mr. Camacho right. re referred to, the garbage, uh, the, the leaves, the greenery, yeah. The bikes, the stop me if you hear something you like. I mean, between all the things that are on the sidewalk, I actually had to leave the sidewalk and cross the street to sure. be able to go where I was going. Sure. So, so we 100% agree um, that the clear path is really the most important feature, right? And actually, in the past, in the in the pre-COVID world, when we had licenses and a review process. The, we did a pretty good job of protecting the clear path, not perfect, but much, much better than what we have in the emergency condition, where again, you know, the benefit was that the city was able to create a program under very short notice and get that relief out to restaurants. But the enforcement is clearly a, a, a huge challenge under the, under the current emergency regime. So in turning on a real regulated program again, which is again, the, you know, the whole point here, when we're talking about the, 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 the limited areas, Again, the text amendments goal is to make sure that a place like East New York, which was prohibited from participating in sidewalk cafes pre COVID for no good reason that we can see 
that they have the potential to participate. The potential to participate means that they have to keep they have to keep that clear. They're going to be subject to the same rules that everyone else is, where they have to keep that clear path. They're going to have to pay fees. They're going to have to play by the rules, and if they don't, they'll be able to have that license revoked. So I want to be very clear that what we're asking for is essentially to put East New York and and I don't you know and, and areas under the elevated on the map so that we're not just saying under no circumstances can you ever have a cafe, right? We're saying under some circumstances where you can play by the rules and meet all the criteria, then you know you you can at least pose the question. Right now they can't if we if if the emergency ended tomorrow, the sidewalk cafes that exist in East New York or under elevateds in, in, in East Brooklyn, they could not, they have no pathway towards legalization. Zero. So that's really the, the goal of the text amendment. And the, the, my and final comment is, and, and then I'll allow uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I need to finish this, please. I do apologize. Oh, can you allow? I, I do apologize. I need to just finish this final item and then I'll I'll, I'll see the floor. I haven't seen anything around ADA compliance. And that's the other reason why I keep belaboring the point about the the um the clear space. Yeah. Uh, because that's also a concern of mine. I'm ambul ambulatory and I have travel navigating yes. the path, much less anyone else. Thank you. Uh I'm so glad you brought that up. And well, you know, I think we would be we'd miss somebody if we the alphabet soup of of reviewing agencies. Um, the mayor's office of persons with disabilities is a really key one that's been a partner, um, you know, throughout and and will be a partner in the future. Um, and 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 again, we you know, it's part of the reason we really share the concern about the clear path rules. Um, we have talked with them about there are certain uh, uh, situations where we would consider waiver conditions. Like on a on a small sidewalk where someone, um, you know, isn't able to meet, and we've talked about specific review uh, and staffing needs for the mayor's office of persons with disabilities to make sure that not just are we, make, you know, baking into the rules that the, you know that they would get a sec, but that they actually have the ability and capacity to do that review. So, um, so important and 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 really fundamental to all of the ways that we're thinking about design. Again, design without enforcement. We hear everyone, you know, it, it, it really, there is, <laughs> there's an imbalance there, but the whole point of the permanent program is to get us back to that more regulated space. Okay. Can we, Madam Chair, to... may, I, may I get a chance to speak CB 13? I, I, I see CB 16, I see CB 16 first. Can you, can Thank CB you, 16 and then, yeah. And then we'll come back to 13. Community board 16. Denise, and then, yeah. So I just wanted to um, raise the point on something that is um, a, parking is a very sensitive matter in my community board. Um, we have had several presentations by DOT um, related to safety changes in the community. Parking spaces have been removed. Um, we're slated to get city bikes in the community. Parking will need to be removed to accommodate the installation of bikes. We haven't had conversations with DOT as of yet about that. And so, um, and then, um, and then there's a mandatory inclusionary housing uh, that zone sex amendment, which took place some time ago, which eliminates the need for or the requirement for parking and these affordable housing uh, projects. And so. The density in the community is changing significantly and parking um, is not included in these projects and then parking keeps being removed for all of these other initiatives. While I think that, you know, they do have some benefit to the community long term, we really have to look at how all of these things overlap and really impede in a very negative way on the quality of life. You can't remove parking entirely and um, you know, expect for people to still invest in certain communities. So um, I'm very concerned that although this all sounds really good, that it can very well have a, a negative effect. Um, you know, the the whole idea or concept of gentrification um, is is really um, becoming this. Uh, it, it's, it looks like a combustion of of issues um, for the people who have lived in these communities for a very long time and have been accustomed to being able to park their cars in front of their homes or, um, you know, with it a short walking distance. And it's becoming increasingly difficult to do that. And I don't think that those 
individuals um, that are, um, you know, designing these text amendments are really taking all of that into consideration. And it seems as though um, they're looking to limit the, um, the, um, the comments that community boards are able to make on certain um, matters. In addition, uh, board members are being term limited for, I think, a, a term of like eight years, four terms. And so there is um, going to be a, a, a loss of historical context and all of that. And so um, I do share the sentiments of Mr. Camacho, where there does need to be a rally and sort of a meeting of the minds to really determine if this is something that we should be considering or if this is something that really needs to be put on the back burner until we really get our communities up and running again, because um, this is becoming too much and too soon. Thank you. Ms. Morgan and CB13. Hi, Lucia, CB Ms. Morgan, hello? Do you have a question with that comment or? No, that was just the comment that I, I really wanted to make, but um, I think that there's a lot more, um, a lot more work that has to go into this conversation. And so yeah, that short period see. of time, um, we need more time to do that. Okay, thank you. For that. If I may just just continue to clarify that the text amendment does not have any effect on parking. Can you repeat that again? I'm sorry. Can the I'm text sorry. amendment that the that 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 were that is in front of everyone is only about sidewalk cafes and about allowing for um, certain areas of the city that were prohibited to be potentially considered for the future program. It's only regarding sidewalk cafes, so it has no effect on parking. But I'm sorry, point of parking duly noted regarding the roadway program. I, I just just want to continue to clarify oh, okay. that that's not part of the action. Okay. And, and there's more okay. process okay. to rolling out the permanent the roadway program. There's Absolutely. a rulemaking process for the roadway. So voting on this text amendment doesn't mean, you know, the, the whole open restaurants will start next week. There, there's right. more process, more work with the community boards to come. Okay. As community board 13 had a question and then um, we're going to close out this item. I'll try to get to, I'll get to 2 questions that we have from the public, but uh, CB 13. Madam chair is actually not a question It's more of a comment because I have to leave. So it's CB 13. Yes. yes well, mm -hmm. CB 13, Lucia Acevedo for the record chairperson. Um, I heard them say that they're pushing this just to the fact that the city council is trying to get this under the, under the rug before. I don't know whatever reason, um, but here's our concern at CB13. Number one, we are an amusement area. We have a congested areas as it is. We can't even walk. We can't even get DCWP there to come and get these illegal vendors off our boardwalks, off our sidewalks, et cetera. These, I asked my brothers, I am gonna ask that each community board, if you really are passionate about this, voted down we had the opportunity to bring it to our community board and we voted it down there was great concerns and we want to talk for others for the other districts for example smith street i mean we're not talking about the road beds now but we want you to hear what we're saying we want you to hear that this is our concerns you turn down a left on smith street you're, you're how many cars have been smacked into how many cars have actually smacked into these um at, um off roadway cafes um, you, you guys never answer that to me at Community Board 13. I'm sure you never have the answer for me. Um, I, I mentioned that the illegal vendors, I, I met, and, I, and as I said, I would request that each community board to please submit your concerns before September, even though they're telling you October. Call an emergency meeting if you have concerns about this. Send it out. Say what you have to say. Enough is enough. Every time we turn around, we say, which agency is going to handle ABC? They say DEF, which you don't know who the heck is DEF. I mean, this is ridiculous. We need to stop it. We need to say. Now, you want to say, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, you want to say this is a great thing for the, for the businesses. Great. And then tomorrow, you'll hit them with violations with a sanitation ticket. You'll hit them with something saying that um, they're not complying, et cetera. The fees might be $2 today. Tomorrow it's going to be 200, 300 dollars. If you're really concerned about them, this would you wouldn't be adding a burden to them and a burden to us to have to deal with the other agencies when we get all these complaints coming in. That's just I just had to say a comment. 
and um, I thank you for letting me. No problem. Thank you for your comment. I am not going to close out this item. Just a moment. Uh, again, from the public, we're looking for questions today. This is not a public hearing. We're looking for comments next month, but we're hoping your questions would help us learn more from the agencies tonight. And surrounded, there's been a lot of action in our chat tonight. If we can make the chat available to all members of the borough board and to our agency representatives, and if the agency representatives could look to respond to those comments between now and next month's borough board, and perhaps post those comments perhaps at either a DOT or city planning website or both so that people could uh, see responses to those comments. That's one thing. Second thing is um, the DOT rules that are talked about for 2023, community boards that already have open streets in their districts, you could look at the examples now that you like, that you don't like. And I think it would be great if community boards could take start formulating positions to say what works, what doesn't work to help formulate what might be eventual rules by DOT. So just wanted to put that out there. Okay. Um, so he indicated, I'm sorry, Monica, he indicated oh, that the permit is for back the floor, Mr. Camacho. Go ahead. He, he indicated that the permit is for four years and that they'll be inspecting it every year. So my question to him is so if I have it for four years and after they inspect it, me the year and I give the restaurant to my buddy, is he grandfathered in? Uh no, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be grandfathered in. But how would situation. you know? How would you know if I gave it to him? Because I could he could still be like that's what they do here. He could still be just quote unquote the buddy and still have it there, still be with oh. the four kids. Right. You know, I understand. They, they, those are, I know you understand what happens is just like city bike. They put a bike rack, but they don't know if it's working. They don't know if they're serving it or helping the community. I've been trying to find data on how much that thing really works and how much, since you're giving the land away, is it right that the community should know if it's working or if it's not working? If it's not working, get the bike out of there. If it's working, guess what? Then put some more. Because that's what's wrong with you guys. Y'all put more stuff there without knowing it's going to work. Because that's what they do here. You give me a four year permit. I'm going to turn around and give it to somebody else, and you don't even know if it's going to work or not going to work because that's what they do. You're living, you're living in a, in a in a fantasy world. I'm living in a hood world. This is what they do to get money. So you really need to address some of these issues and concerns that we're having. You know, we can't vote on something, and we can't go back to our boards and tell them this is what they want to do when you ain't giving us no answers. You didn't give us nothing since you've been here. All you've done is talk your mouth, and I didn't see anything positive came out of there. But wanting to help, and then you use East New York, you use Latinos and Black communities to get your agenda. Oh, we're helping them. No, they're not the ones that buying. Our gentrifiers are the ones that are purchasing this, and you're catering to them. The status quo. So we really need to do a survey to find out how many people in East New York are really helping. So we, we we have a lot of questions um, this evening in regards to this particular item. As Richard noted that um, we do have some questions in the chat, and this is not the public hearing um, a, a portion for this item, but we're glad to hear all the concerns and all the comments because it kind of gives us feedback to what the boards kind of feel and what their communities are experiencing. So uh, with that note, that any additional questions that we have for um, board members with what we have in the chat. I guess we'll get that over uh, to uh, planning as Richard noted, and then they could come back with answers to those questions um, for the next meeting or at your respective community board meeting. And I believe there's another item Mr. Camacho had noted that he wanted to take up something um, this this evening um, after road call, but that'll be, I believe the next steps in action. Richard? Concur, agree? Correct. You're, you're on mute, Richard. Our next step would be after we have the opportunity just for, again, questions. The idea would be community boards would be using the next four weeks towards developing positions to the extent that enough community boards could help me draft a borough board resolution with a lot of impact from community boards. The goal would be to circulate an agenda around the end of September, early October, 
have a borough board vote if we can pass one with or without conditions, uh, approval or disapproval with conditions. Um, the city planning commission will know for sure next week if the commission is going to hold their hearing on October 6th, or if not, the 6th will be October 20th, right? Because the commission's got to put out their calendar. There's going to be a hearing on September 14th. So we'll know pretty soon if this is going to be on the agenda for the 6th or the 20th of October. So even though 27th of September was mentioned, as far as you're concerned as community boards, if you could get a recommendation in before the city planning commission hearing, great. You heard representatives, they're not going to shut down your information if you get their information to city planning after the hearing. And if for some reason you can't report in to the commission as a community board before the commission votes, you certainly have the opportunity before the city council would make a, a, a final determination of text. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so with that, um, we are going to close out this um, item with the note that questions that we have in the chat will be uh, sent to the Department of City Planning. Um, we'd like to thank um, Benjamin and Dash and Caroline for presenting this evening with our boards. Once again, we encourage all boards to be in contact with City Planning regarding this item, especially since there's a lot of deep concerns um, with some of the uh, with some of the the, the text. Um, there was a question. We don't. We don't. This to be clear. We don't have a, res a resolution yet. There was a question in chat. Um, that 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 resolution comes from you know the board members and is drafted and sent for edit. So there's no resolution on that this item for this evening, to be clear. Um, with that being said, we are going to go back to our first item, the agenda, which is to do road call, roll call. So I'm going to have Hercules read, Hercules? Yes. yes. I'm going to have you, you could uh, call the roll. All right, all right. Thank you, Serena. If everyone can take the time to unmute their phone and verbally say present uh, when I call your name, uh, it'd be very helpful. Thank you. So we're going to start with the community boards. Community board one. Present. Community board two. Community board two. Community board three. Present. Community board four. Amato, present. Community board five. Community board five. Community board six. Community board six. Community board seven. Community board seven. Community board eight. Present. Community board nine. About TV nine chair present. Community board ten. Ten. Yes, ten. Community board 10, can you unmute? Community board 10. I'm sorry, Lori Willis, chair, present. Great, thank you. I was like, I know I heard you earlier. All right, perfect. Um, community board 11. Community board 11. Community board 12. Community board 12. Community board 13. Lucia Savito for CB 13, chairperson. Thank you. Community board 14. Joanne Brown, chair, present. Thank you. Community board 15. Teresa Scavo, chair, present. Community board 16. Denise Morgan, chair. Did I hear a Present from 16. Okay. Community board 17. Don Alexander Bakre Dean, chairperson, present. Thank you. Community board 18. 
community board 18. And with that, we'll switch over to council. Inez Barron, District 42. Councilman Robert Corn. Wait, is that a yes? Nope. Okay. Um, Councilman Robert Cornegy. Ian Fullerton for Councilmember Cornegy present. Thank you. Councilwoman Farrah Lewis, District 35. Lori Cumbo. District 45. Sorry, I, I misspoke. District 35, Lori Cumbo. Or Majority Leader Lori Cumbo. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Councilwoman Dharma Diaz, District 37. Council 37, Dharma Diaz. Council Office District 40, Matthew Eugene. Matthew Eugene, District 40. Councilman Justin Brennan, District 43. Councilman Justin Brennan, Councilman Kalman Yeager, Councilman Yeager, 44, Brad Lander, present. Thank you. Councilman Stephen Levin, District 33, Stephen Levin, District 33, District 46, Alan Mazel. District 46, Alan Mazel is uh, present. Okay. Uh, is someone trying to speak? Sorry, yes. Um, Jonathan Aline for Councilman Alan Mazel of the 46th District. Thank you, Jonathan. Council District 41, Alika Ampri Samuels. President Kim Robinson. Okay. Uh, District Council 38, Carlos Menchaca. Uh, Ting Lin for Council Member Menchaca, present. Great. Uh, 34, District 34, Antonio Reynoso. District 34, Antonio Reynoso. Okay. Uh, District 47, Mark Traeger. District 30, 47, Mark Traeger. Uh, District 45, Farrah Lewis. District 45, Farrah Lewis. And of course, the Borough President's Office. Present. All right, I'll give you a count right now. I have 18. 18. I count 18 with the borough president office present. Would that be there said? Is a, there is quorum established. Thank you. Um, so since quorum is established, we would like to um, handle our first item on the agenda, which is the acceptance of the minutes from June 1st. Um, minutes were sent out to members in advance. We would like to adopt these minutes from June 1st. Copies were sent out. Um, are there any corrections to the minutes sent out for June 1st? For members, we'll see. Is there a motion to accept? Teresa Scabo, Community Board 15, motions to approve the minutes as printed. Joan Alexander Bakradine seconds it. Community Board 17. 15 and 17 second. Um, all, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, Aye. any opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any, any, any opposed? Any member abstain? Just check. Nope. With that being said, the minutes from June the first has been adopted, um, and that uh, closed out our item uh, regarding our minutes from uh, our last meeting. Community We're, board eleven. Uh, community board eleven. Can for the record. One 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 to be sure that is counted. Present. As counted present, so that the record reflect community board eleven. Community board 11 is present. This meeting. Okay. So me. Thank you. Okay. Madam chair, that makes it 19. Okay. Take note of that, Serana. <laughs> no, Perfect. 
Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to our last item on the agenda for this evening. And this is going back to an item that we had in June. Um, so as you may recall, city plan and present a proposal to the board board on June 1st. At the June 1st meeting, the board president adopted a motion to submit letters to city planning, seeking that these items not be brought to the city planning until October the 20th for public hearing in order to allow boards and time to take a position prior to the, uh, the board board's consideration. Despite the written request, the commission will have its public hearing on September 22nd. As a result, in order for to ensure the board has a weigh in, we are having this joint hearing and we have circulated a draft for resolutions on these items that are sh that were shared with the board members uh, last week, and we also asked for additional input. The representatives from the Department of City Plan are here tonight, and we're available to respond to any questions from board members that might have they may have regarding the health and fitness. Oh, the health and fitness, and also fresh uh, text amendment. Okay, um, so we do have City Plan in here. Uh, before uh, they uh, take the floor, we just want to note there was two resolutions that were circulated. Um, one of them, um, during while we had this meeting, or right prior, there was an edit that was made to one of the resol to one particular um, resolution, which was uh, fresh, which was the fresh amendment that was circulated in the email. So if you check your email now, that new resolution will be there. We're also going to have. Um, a representative from our office read uh, both resolutions, and then once they read those resolutions, we will look at the amendments as proposed to the board and address any other concerns in regards to um, continuing with this particular item. So, this is a, also a public hearing. So, do we have Dylan Sandal and Jacqueline Sunwu from the Department of, of City Planning and also? And also a, uh, a part of the economic development division. Yes, good evening. This is Dylan Sandler from the Department of City Planning. Okay. Wonderful. So both representatives are here to answer any questions that we may have. I don't believe that we need an overview. If we do need an overview, the members, please let me know and they'll just give a little bit of overview before we go into a resolution, before we go into um, the resolution that was issued. Um, so I would like to open up the floor from comments from the board members pertaining um, these two items. I believe the first one that we're going to start off with, which you correct me, let me see. The first resolution that we are going to look at, I wanna make sure I'm able to pull it up, would probably be the fresh, the fresh amendment, yeah, okay. So we'll look at fresh first. Um, I already see hands up for questions from the board. Um, do you guys need um, a quick uh, overview? Or are we gonna go straight into the resolution? Otherwise, we'll open the floor for questions and I see CB16 has a question. Do you have a question? Do you have a question regarding these two text amendments? Do we need an uh, overview, a quick, from city planning. Madam, Madam Chair, if, yes. if I could request if we could get a brief, a very, very brief synopsis. Yes, so we'll, a brief, yes. Uh, I can, Dylan, I can start with fresh since yep. that seems to be um, the first on the agenda. So a very brief overview. Um, FRESH is an existing program in the zoning resolution currently, um, and the purpose of FRESH is to encourage construction of supermarkets in underserved areas of the city. Um, the reason we're before you guys today is because we're proposing to update the program, and these updates include expansion of the FRESH boundary into some of the additional neighborhoods, including Brooklyn. We're also proposing to include a mechanism to stall concentration of FRESH supermarkets, um, as well as modification to the glazing requirements on the ground floor of conversion projects. We're also proposing to modify some of the parking relief regulations, as well as some zoning text cleanups. Um, if that wasn't clear enough, I can open up the floor for any questions that you guys may have. 
as uh, the Madam Chair talked about, we are going to the CPC public hearing on the September 22nd. So before we open up to the public, we'd like to open up for questions um, to the to our to our membership. CB CB4 Camacho, you have a revised version draft that was just sent to me that you guys did. What was what was re, one what was rever, re, revised uh, to to to, and what was taken away from to add the the revised? Because you guys, it says revised nine eight twenty one draft. So what what in this context, uh, this did you guys revive or take away or add? Is there anyone that can answer that? I can um, certainly uh, answer that. Yes, Richard. Yep. Okay. Yes, Richard. So Thank you. In coordination with borough board members, when we get feedback from borough board members, we try to update. So in working with district 14, with uh, board 14, we removed the area of community board for community district 14 south of Avenue H from the draft. So the board had more time to think about it and, and that was its feedback to just focus on the northern half of the board. So just board 14 in that okay. uh, amendment. So, yeah, so so four had an issue with uh, them removing uh, parking spaces that uh, consequently uh, 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 they were renting out, but since nobody's renting out some of these uh, 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 building because the rent is, uh, is the to rent to to rent the car is more money than paying the rent, so they're not using it. So now the space they have, they want to do a fresh direct. So now they're getting their money double. We can't live in these buildings, but yet they're going to put fresh direct to feed us to take over the land. So I, I, I don't understand because we have one individual that uh, was requesting a fresh, but wanted to eliminate some of the parkings on the ground that he had because he wasn't getting enough parking. So now he wants to double dip and make more money. So what are we doing about that when they're eliminating parking space that wasn't, uh, that they were uh, trying to make money off, but saw that they couldn't make any money. So now they're gonna make money, making believe they servicing the fresh direct to get us healthy and not give us a place to live. So Robert just noted that district four has always been in the fresh proposal since was adopted and you know, city planning can certainly weigh in the intent of reducing and making it easier to eliminate the parking requirement for the fresh stores was to help the economics work. So that a developer would be willing to entertain a tenant who would open up a food store. So that's the context of the parking and commercial parking. Even if it was previously generated by a supermarket use, it did not affect whether that space would be used by the supermarket or not. The zoning allows that space to be rented on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. The zoning didn't preclude that. So even when they were providing spaces at a supermarket, it didn't affect whether it was simply provided or used as a economic resource to charge for parking, not necessarily for a supermarket shopper. Yeah, I know, but but my my thing is now that they 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 what they call double dipping. They had the land, they opened it up, they gave us mandatory reclusionary housing, which is not really affordable. Now they couldn't do nothing because nobody wanted to park because they could park outside for free. So now we're giving them space and giving them more square footage to do a fresh. I don't know, man. I don't know if I'm getting dumber or, or smarter at an older age, but um, I guess it is what it is. Yeah, so the decision is, do you want to try to do things to result in more fresh food stores coming into the neighborhood? That That's really the balancing act between allowing development with or without parking. And David Perez, I believe you have a copy of the new revised um, draft resolution that was sent out. And you could, if you want, you could put it up on the screen. So I believe I'm going to have someone uh, read the resolution as is, but the resolution drafted, um, it generally calls for approval of a proposal or modification or remove the option to convert a fresh supermarket um, to another use without requiring parking as of right option after 25 years for certified uh, occupancy insurance 
expanding fresh to Red Hook, Sunset Park, Community Board 14, as well as removal of the section proposed by Bar Park. And just to note, uh, Community Board 12813 um, have approved this matter. I'm going to have this resolution. Uh, Hercules, could you yep, go yep. over this read this re resolution that was issued? Yes. yes. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. cool. So, um, the Brooklyn Borough Board is in support of the intent to modify the special regulations applying to the food retail expansion to support health fresh food stores, a measure intended to facilitate neighborhood grocery stores throughout New York City by expanding the program boundary as well as introducing updates that will be applicable to both existing eligible areas and areas of proposed expansion. Fresh provides incentives for neighborhood grocery stores to locate and or be retained in underserved neighborhoods in the city with the objective of having convenient, accessible stores that provide fresh fruit and vegetables, meat, and other perishable goods, in addition to full range of grocery products towards realizing a greater diversity of shopping options, as well as improving the accessibility and affordability of food available to local residents. The FRESH program would expand from Brooklyn Community Districts 3, 4, 5, parts of 8, 9, 16, and 17 to include parts of 1, 2, 12, and 13. Again, the program will expand from existing districts to include 1, 2, 12, and 13. Consequently, the increased convenience and availability of fresh foods can provide options of, for healthier choices. Fresh 2 proposes a mechanism to prevent the out oversaturation of fresh supermarkets. This would be done by introducing a cap of 40,000 square feet of zoning exempt floor area within a half mile radius of a produce of a proposed fresh grocery store. As a means to minimize construction costs, burdens for existing buildings seeking to qualify under fresh, the amendments also seek to reduce the glazing requirement for conversions. The proposed amendment introduces a reduction of required parking in lower density R3, R4, R5, C41 zoning districts to one parking space per every 400 square foot of the used floor area with no parking needed for fresh food stores, not to excess of 10,000 square feet. Whereas for the space designated as a fresh food store, that had its initial issuance of a certificate of op occupancy, C of, C of O, at least 25 years prior, the New York City Department of City Planning seeks to exempt from the New York City Zoning Resolution Section 6324 required accessory off-street parking spaces in certain districts. The need to require a City Planning Commission authorization, uh, ZR 6350, to change the use without meeting the requirement to provide parking. DCP has not provided a justification to support the, re the relaxation of the requirement to allow the change of use without community board input. Therefore, in order to remove a potential out year financial disincentive towards retaining or reactivating a vacated fresh food store, the Brooklyn Borough Board calls for the proposed exemption of vacated fresh food stores that are at least 25 years from the date of issuance of a C of O to still require CPC authorization to remove such otherwise required parking. Whereas DCP's environmental assessment statement for the fresh update zoning tax amendment includes a map depicting a supermarket need index, SNI. With the SNI, are significant portions of Brooklyn's community district seven sunset park neighborhood, which was high concentrations of food. Uh, food deserts, while the northern end of CD 14 includes multiple single story taxpayer supermarkets with extensive development rights. CD sevens red hook neighborhood has lost 2 thirds of its supermarkets, including the 2 most proximate to the New York city housing authority red hook houses. 
since the preparation of the SNI as depicted. Therefore, in order to provide the fresh incentive to underserved areas and areas at risk of being underserved, the Brooklyn Borough Board calls for CD6 south of west of Hamilton Avenue, CD7 south of 36th Street, and the section of CD14 north of Avenue H to be included as a part of Appendix A map fresh food store designated areas. Though for CD 14, north of Avenue H, fresh zoning floor area exemption shall be applicable to development sites already occupied by one story supermarkets. Whereas, though the western section of CD 12 is listed as the SNI, in, in the SNI as having an absence of fresh food stores, this section of CD 12 provides a vast quantity of special food stores that collectively provides shoppers with an abundance of fresh food in a neighborhood with a long history of patrons, patrons going to multiple food merchants as a part of food shopping tradition. And finally, therefore, in support of the collection of food-based merchants that provide the equivalent of quality food services as otherwise found in a larger grocery store. The Brooklyn Borough Board calls for the removal of parts of CD12 from Appendix A, Map 12. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so, with the revised uh, resolution, um, do we have any questions from our board members? Or comments from our board members? Serana um, Teresa Scavo, have the boards that have been mentioned in this resolution? Have they given this input that they want to be removed or placed in? Has this come directly from those boards? Uh, Richard, you could correct me. I believe yes. The request came, uh, I believe, CB12. Richard? So, oh, CB12, yes. absolutely in coordination. Um, we've worked with them as a council member, uh, and that was their input. So that did not generate from Borough Hall. CB14, combination of working with CB14 and council mem one of the council members. Uh, in terms of District 6, it was Borough Hall discretion. We tried coordinating with Community Board 6, um, did not hear back. Um, but we are very aware that we are down to a food bazaar at the very tip where Fairway was. We lost the supermarket directly on Lorraine, and we lost the path mark on Hamilton. So that was Borough Hall uh, discretion, and the community board did not weigh in. And with District 7, we did also reach out to representatives, but again, looking at that mapping, uh, if you go to the page and I map it, it's very much indicating food desert. So it was Borough Hall discretion to put that in there, but the community board did not give us feedback to remove it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, was, was, there, was there a reason why the board didn't respond? You are or? absolutely our partners as board members. CB9? Yeah, that was the question. So was there a reason why the board did not respond? Was that because of the, the, the summer hiatus or? Richard, did you? You're on mute, Richard. I didn't get that clearly, Fred. Can you give that me again? Uh, in regards uh, to the boards that you mentioned, is there a reason why they did not respond? You're on mute again. If they have representatives here tonight, we'll learn. Uh, if not, I really can't answer that. You know, I can only put the information out there. Uh, in both cases, I put the information out there before we circulated the initial reso. So, like a half a week before we even did the draft, we decided when we did not have back for them, it was too important to try to get fresh food in those locations. So, we made a decision after not hearing them to put that in the initial draft. So, it's been like a week and a half that we first tried to engage. Thank you for that information. Uh, so, so just to go very quickly, I think that 
there's a lot of frustration for me this evening in terms of I think this is a repeated pattern we're seeing for the city in terms of these actions are being taken, these things are being done. We're not getting full explanation. We're not being respected as partners in the process in terms of being afforded the appropriate time to be able to give responses. As a board, uh, we don't turn on the drop of a dime. So once it's presented, obviously we have committee meetings, we have uh, board meetings that it goes to. We try to have hearings or presentations, uh, you know, so that way we can get educated, understand what the issues are, get the information. Uh, so again, I think with uh, I was really mad about the last presentation that came in and it. I think June 27th. This one, I think, only came in a month before that, barely, uh, with all of us going into election season. And then right after that, we go into um, summer hiatus. And then it's even more difficult because we also put in the position of, with the open meetings law be, uh, with the, you know, being reinstated, who could even possibly go ahead and even try and convene these meetings because you couldn't find a public spot if you wanted to. Um, and then we have the expectation when we come back, um, where we basically get a flat no. I, I didn't even see a letter or a response or something like that addressing the concern. All we get is a no, they're pushing ahead with it. Um, and again, it goes back to the whole idea where you have powers that be that are trying to force agendas uh, to have these things go through. And the irony being, they're not even going to be here and be accountable for them once these things are actually established. Uh, one of the questions that I do have with the pressure program is that while I understand the intent in terms of putting markets, I don't think we want to necessarily, you know, I, I think that it's a lot to ask us to give away parking and add density uh, when we don't understand what's the real impact. Because sure, you can put a supermarket in there, but if it's not affordable, if it's something that's not addressing the needs of the community, then why are we going to give that away right off the bat? I think there's some additional work that needs to be done in terms of making sure that it's options that the community can really use in terms of affordability, access. Obviously, access is one of the things, but we want to make sure that we need to have that included as part of the deal before we decide to codify this and make this a text amendment as part of the way we're going to do business as a city in the future. Um, it, you know, it's really difficult because I can't say one way or another that I'm against this, but I definitely at this stage can't say I'm for it either because I think that there's just not been enough information and communication and data provided to the board to be able to make this kind of a decision. And we respect your concern that is uh, that is definitely shared. And once again, this is a this is a it's a voting item. So it's something the board could vote on. It's something as a board you could not take a not necessarily take a vote. Um, we may leave this meeting. We may vote on a resolution. We may not vote on the resolution. Um, you sharing your concern may be. A way that other board members may also have similar concerns. Some members did vote on this item. And so if any members kind of voted on this item of why they're supporting it, that could be helpful too. I think Fred is coming from a place of um, his meetings later in the year and the need of uh, requesting additional time. Um, so but some board members were able to take it up. So if there's board members that uh, fail of their support the resolution or this particular program, then I'd like to take the floor. We welcome you to speak and address the board. And anyone that feels that you know they have other issues regarding this particular resolution, we could we could have that discussion too as well. I, I, I'm sorry, I do have a question um, about so the, the timeline for ending this call because I have another call that was supposed to start it off about 11 minutes ago, but this topic is too important to my community for me not to be present to hear its conclusion. Um, I will like to be wrapped up by I seven, hopefully. Um, but uh, as we know, we are going to try to get as much um, input and, and get a vote in and um, and see how we could, you know, uh, conclude the night um, of where we stand. So we'll, we'll try to move as amp as we can, but we had like a robust agenda. Um, I see CB 10 has their hands up 10. Yes, thank you. Um, Lori Willis, Chair CB10. I have a procedural question just because this was shown on the agenda. Um, we have two uh, text amendments that are listed on the agenda for this evening as one. Um, and I was um, hoping that we could divide that vote um, instead of having a vote on both amendments um, just because the actions of my board um, are not both consistent. 
Um, and yes, correct. Uh, they are, there are going to be two votes and two different resolutions. Is that? Yes, thank you. Yes. So we're just dealing with fresh. Then we're going to go to health and fitness right after right after this. Serena Teresa Scavo, does everyone vote on the fresh amendment or only the boards included? Um, all boards. Um, it's a board board, so all boards will vote. Okay. On the on the fresh amendment. Um, any other questions for members before I ask the members from the public? Yes, Hi, yes, Joan. I do have one question oh, yes. about the so with the removal of parking, how then do we accommodate the delivery oh. trucks and, and, and still maintain pedestrian safety? I'll let city planning drop in if they need to, but uh the key is this is customer parking, not delivery parking. That would be classified in the zone resolution as a loading requirement. So there's nothing that I'm aware of that removes loading requirements, but I'll let city planning also confirm that. Richard, I confirmed that answer. How did you confirm the answer? I'm sorry, can Hello? you say it again? Um, the rules, the regulations regarding loading does not change. It's only for uh, customer parking as Richard. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from board members or concerns regarding this particular resolution for fresh? Yes. Hi, this is Ting from Council Member Menchaca's office. Just mm -hmm. quick question and let me know if this has been shared already. Is there a map uh, that exists of where and how many fresh supermarkets will be at each uh, community board? I, I can so try to answer that. Um, we assessment. There is a page, I don't know the page number, it shows you where we've received every fresh facility in Brooklyn to date. So moving forward, wherever there's a commercial district, there's a possibility for a fresh store to be granted. However, based on the new proposed requirements, if adopted, there has to be an evaluation done before city planning certifies this to say, that we have not given away 40,000 square feet of free zoning within 500 feet of the store. So that's gonna be a fluid process in terms of where we keep mapping the fresh food stores. Thank you. And um, any other questions from board members, voting board members? Do we have any uh, questions from the public regarding this text amendment. Not and I believe I saw one from the council member Manchaka's office. Yes, she uh, that was Ting. She got in her questions. I don't see any other hands. Um, Susan, do you have a question? Your hands are up from the members of the public regarding this item. Okay. All right. So uh, once again, this is the resolution. Each community board has they have their own vote. Each council office have their own vote. Um, if this item, uh, once you vote, it goes two ways. It could pass tonight. It could not pass tonight, but the resolution is here. It took feedback and account from a number of boards and the number of boards support the initiative. And of course, we heard from members who like the proposal, but they will just like to get more time to get into the weeds, and we we definitely respect that, um, you know, as a as a body. So, uh, with that being said, uh, it doesn't seem there's any other questions. I uh, I am calling. I like to call. This is a motion I'm putting on the floor uh, to approve the proposed updates with modification, elimination of the proposal to remove the city planning commission authorization role from change of use that seeks to eliminate of parking after a certificate of occupancy have been in effect for at least 25 years. Modification that designate area map to include Red Hook Sunset Park Community Board 14 through limiting CB 14 eligibility north of Avenue H to existing supermarket sites. Modification to remove the proposed designation of Bar Park. And with that being said, that'll be the modifications that are made 
via this resolution. Um, so there is a motion on the floor. All council members' offices, uh, community boards, and of course the board presidents are uh, amped our vote. And since this is an item, we would do this. And uh, is there a well? Is there a motion to accept the resolution? That's you know that's a question we have to propose, right? Um, as amended to accept the amendment. As as amended with uh yes with amendments. I make a motion that we accept the resolution with the amended report proposal. Teresa Scavo seconds the motion. So CB one has a motion. CB fifteen second. Okay. Um. And we will do, I guess, I, for this particular item, I'm sure everyone would like their vote recorded. So we'll do individual member groups. Um, so could we do a road poll for the community boards? Excuse right. me, uh, uh, excuse me, chair. Yes. Could, could, this is uh, your support this spoon, CB8. Can you just, uh, can you just uh, repeat the, the motion, please? Oh, yes. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Um, so, we like a motion to approve the proposed fresh updates or modifications. Elimination of the proposal to remove the city planning commission authorization role for a change to use that seeks the elimination of parking after certify of occupancy has been in effect for at least 25 years. Modification that the design area maps include Red Hook, Sunset Park, Community District 14 to limit CB 14 eligibility north of Avenue H to existing supermarket sites. Modification to remove the proposed designated the designation of Bar Park. Um, those are the modifications for this for this resolution. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, with that being said, we will do a roll call on this vote once again. This is a resolution that's up for vote for each individual. Board uh, so, uh, board. Is, there, is there any discussion on the motion? Uh, not that the motion is on the floor. Is there any discussion? Uh, I'm asking, is there, was there any dis additional discussion on the motion itself? I, I, or? I just want yeah. to offer this one point very briefly. Yes, so please do. The challenge, the challenge here is this, and, and for those boards who were able to respond and, and give those, I noticed that there are carve-outs, so that there are going to be sections of Brooklyn that will be exempted from this. But the issue and the challenge is that if we do vote for for this, all of Brooklyn will be affected by that, except for those pieces that we actually carved out right now, if that's even accepted by the, the city planning committee. So that's exactly. part of the reason why I think that there are issues with doing it this way, because then we almost sound like, okay, well, listen, we're good with your plan. Whereas I think that there are just too many impacts that we don't know how it's gonna affect. I definitely don't know how it's gonna affect CB9, and I think a, a number of boards might feel the same way. So that's why I say we need to be very cautious about accepting this and putting this as forward as what the Brooklyn Borough Board uh, is, is good. Yeah. And as a board, there is no pressure to, you know, to 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 vote for the to resolution. We're going to issue a vote and then each vote to vote individually. Fred, thank you for sharing that. Um, any other public comments? Yeah, the, the, the each, the each uh, uh, board chair and everyone voted. On this uh, uh, specific way, or, 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 or we're we're just agreeing because we want to agree. Because if each community voted some way, then I think we should be uh, uh, representing in, in, in the peers and in, in what they they voted on. Because obviously they they voted on this, did they? Uh, yeah, yeah. So there were there were like yes, as Richard stated, there are boards that you know send feedback on this res resolution. If Richard, you free want to review those boards again, so we kind of know, so you can hear from the, the peers that the district that's going to be in, in, impacted. Um, if anyone feels because, like because you, my 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 question is my question is because if some board didn't have an opportunity to vote on it, then I don't think we should be voting for them without them knowing they're the ones that live in that community, not us. So, you know, we can you can take that to, and Mr. Camacho, and you could take that into consideration with your, with your vote. So, Thank if you, you, yeah, you could take that in consideration with your vote here um, this evening. So, if there's factors of concerns, your individual vote, you could take that into consideration 
with your with the vote that you have. Any other questions or comments or, or, or concerns? And thank you for sharing that 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 point. Uh, Joanne Brown, CB14. I just have a quick question for Richard Barrick. So, um, if the resolution passes uh, tonight and it goes to CPC, um, but let's say um, there are changes that a community board might want to make for some that haven't been able to meet, procedurally, can they include changes after tonight? So, while the borough board resolution would be done, first of all, any member of the borough board, when they vote as a community board member, they don't have to have the same vote that they have as a borough board member. And the borough board, whatever information that they put out there, that could be shared with the 14 community boards that have not yet voted. And if the borough board said anything helpful, great. If they disagree with the borough board, that that's fine as well. It's up to the city planning commission and ultimately the city council to decide to what extent anything that the borough board does and anything that community boards will do past tonight, you know, how that will affect the larger process. So everything is fluid. Thank you for that. Any other discussion? And as there is no further discussion on this item um, from the boards or a member of the public, um, uh, we we had a motion um, by CB1, second by uh, CB15. Um, we are going to do uh, official go through the, the roll of members. Hercules, are you there? Yep. And we'll make sure that we mark your votes. Dillingly. So we'll begin. Yes, begin with the community boards. All uh, right. So you could call the roll. And once again, this is for the motion that is on the that is on the floor. Taken into consideration all that was shared through um, through feedback from the boards and what was discussed here tonight. Okay. All right. I'll be going based on who has already shared that they're present. Well, we could just, I mean, we could just go straight through one because I have a sheet to, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, CB1, how do you yes. vote? Yes. CB2. Community board, how two, how do you vote? Community board three, how do you vote? Abstain and Richard Flatow, chair, I stepped away when you did the roll call. Okay, um, community board four, how do you vote? No. Community board five, how do you vote? Community board six. Community board seven. Community board eight, how do you vote? Yes. Community board nine. Maybe not abstain. Community board 10. Abstain. Community board 11. No. Community board 12. Community board 13. Community board 13. Community board 14. Yes. Community board 15. Abstain. Community board 16. Yes. Community board 17. Abstain. Community board 18. Co council members. Councilwoman Inez Barron. Councilman Robert Carnegie. Councilman Robert Carnegie. Councilwoman Lori Cumbo. Yes. Councilwoman Dharma Diaz. Matthew Eugene. Councilman Matthew Eugene. Councilman Justin Brennan. Councilman Kalman Yeager. 
Councilman Brad Lander. Councilman Brad Lander. Councilman Stephen Levin. Councilman Alan Mazel. Uh, Abstain. Councilwoman Alika Samuel. Yes. Councilman Carlos Menchaca. Councilmember Menchaca. Councilman Carlos Menchaca. For Councilmember Menchaca. Yes. Is is there a vote from the Councilman Menchaca's office? Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Um, Councilman Antonio Reynoso. Councilman Mark Traeger. Councilwoman Farrah Lewis. And those are all the borough, the board. The board, board president has a vote. The borough president's office? Yes. All right. Okay. That's it. All right. So we are just going to, for the record, just check the votes. Um, I see only eight yeses, so I do not believe that it carries. It doesn't carry in the abstain one, two. Oh, the, the six abstain and two no votes. It's eight and eight. Five. It doesn't carry. So, nope. So, the, so correct. So, the motion does not carry. Um, the resolution with amendments will not be approved. Um, uh, that's that's where it stands for the record. And once point, again. Point, point of order. What is the current? Do we have quorum? Uh, yes, we do. We have yes, we do. We have uh, we have we had nineteen, right? Um, but as a stand now, it doesn't. Uh, we don't have the we don't have the votes to pass the resolution tonight. Right? Could you repeat the vote count though? Uh, yes. So, so uh, uh, if you need okay. Serena, it is eight yes, six abstention, two no. Sixteen, and what is quorum? Uh, it's 18. Okay, thank you. It's 18. Motion oh. failed. Yes, so motion, yes, correct. So motion fail. Um, so that would, so the motion fail on this item. Uh, Richard, just, uh, if you could just go over next steps now, as this motion has not carried before we go into the next item. Right. So unless somebody puts out a new motion, to vote on, like, for example, voting the same conditions as a no vote instead of a yes, um, or any other permutation, then the borough board doesn't have a position tonight. Uh, whatever information was learned here tonight, community boards can dig, dig back with them, right? And still be influenced by the conversation tonight. Um, the borough board could revisit the same motion next month, even though the commission would have had their hearing. It may not be too late to influence the commission, so we could reconsider voting based on additional boards that would take a position, which might uh, affect us to consider modifying the draft motion we have tonight or staying with the draft motion. And if more members are comfortable not abstaining next month and doing the same motion or a slightly revised motion, we could attempt to vote this again next month. Thank you for that. So that concludes our business with the fresh text amendment. We'll move on to our next voting item uh, for questions and hearing. We'll discuss the health and fitness All zone right. amendment. I, I'm sorry, was there a question? Yeah, just real quick, Serena. For the purpose of the record, I think I stated I misspoke. Uh, the vote count was eight yes and eight abstentions and two no's. Okay, give me one. So we'll have uh, three. Nine, eleven. I have fifteen, seventeen. Well, I, I have the tally here: six abstention, eight yes, and two no votes. When uh, 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 the abstention is a no vote anyway, so it's eight and eight. No, I, I, that's the correction I just made, Mr. Camacho. Who, 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 who was the? Reed. Who, who was the? Who was the other two abstentions? There was only six. Um, I have a uh, CB three. I have CB nine. I have CB ten. Mm -hmm. 
I have CB 15, I have CB 17. I also, and I have uh, uh, my Zao. Six, that's it. Correct. And as full, yep, and as full knows, uh, we, uh, I'll, I'll be in. You know, there's only two, which is yeah. myself and someone else, and, and, uh, and the eight yeses. Yeah, so that was a four and 11. Correct, so it's gonna be two no, eight yes, and six abstentions, so that means it's, uh, an, an abstention is a no vote. Correct. Thank you. All right. So that's it's correct. It's not. It's not eight. It's six. Six abstentions, not eight abstentions. Yeah, and you recorded this, uh, six abstentions and and two, and uh, two no's and the eight yes yes. That's how Thank we know the record. Thank you. Okay. So that concludes our business with uh, fresh. We will now look at a proposed resolution for health and fitness zone and text amendment. This draft resolution was also sent out to members. It generally calls for approval of a proposal with modifications to trigger more circumstances with verification for uh, where for engineer to be required and requesting such engineer to be licensed, expand definition of massage supervision as well as define operation hours of in a resident district and in C1 local residential street district, limited size, limiting the size of a fitness establishment when on the neat abundance of res, uh, residential use. Note that this that community boards one and two approve. CB8 has size limitations. CB10, 13, 15, and 18 disapprove with noise as a common theme along with potential illegal use. The draft revolution, uh, resolution attempt to address such concerns. Um, so we would like to open up the floor for questions and comments for members. Once again, we do have a representative from the Department of Senior Planning and Richard here to answer any questions that we may have. And then uh, before that, we will just do, are you ready for the read for the resolution? We'll just go read the resolutions. And I know the time now is, is seven o'clock, but this is the last um, item on the um, agenda. So. Uh, Brooklyn Borough Board Resolution. Hi guys. Uh, the Brooklyn Board, the Brooklyn Borough Board is in support of the intent to amend the New York City zoning resolution to allow gymnasiums, spas, and licensed massage therapy and other health and fitness related uses defined as physical, cultural, or health establishments to be as as of right by removing the requirement for these facilities to receive a special permit from the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals as a means of further enabling the establishment of small businesses that provide health related amenities and communities. As proposed, establishments such as gyms, spas, and other facilities with activities designed to promote physical fitness and health will be allowed in all commercial permitting districts and in manufacturing districts when limited to 10,000 square feet and floor area, while larger facilities will not be allowed in the neighborhood commercial districts designated as C1 where they exist in Brooklyn. To address the, the potential for health and fitness establishments creating objectionable noise and adjacent uses, as well as higher intensity uses, uses such as gyms involving the use of exercise machines and weights, these facilities will be subject to additional noise attenuation requirements and enclosure criteria. It would treat licensed massage therapy studios in the same manner as other health care facilities by categorizing them as ambulatory health care and community facility use group 4A and commercial use group 6B, healthcare office. Whereas the New York City Department of City Planning, DCP zoning resolution definition for health and fitness establishments defined as containing high intensity uses includes gymnasiums, gymnasiums where the predominant use of floor space involves the use of, of exercise equipment or weights, as well as gymnasiums and other indoor recreation establishments used for activities, including basketball, handball, Martial, martial arts for adults, paddle ball, racquetball, rock climbing, soccer, squash, tennis, or volleyball, though predominant use might merely mean in excess of 50%. It is a standard that does not provide an adequate evolution or evaluation for noise and vibration protection for larger facilities. 
The Brooklyn Borough Board seeks to modify ZR 1210 to also define health and fitness establishments as containing high intensity uses when the overall floor space is in excess of 2,000 square feet and more than 1,000 square feet or floor space involves the use of exercise equipment or weights that such space shall be subject to the supplement use regulations of ZR 32-413, which mandate that an acoustical engineer shall verify to the New York City Department of Buildings prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy of design meeting specified noise and vibration standards. Whereas the DCP proposed New York City ZR 1210 definition for unlicensed physical treatment establishment as any establishment that includes as part of its services, whether as a principal use or as an accessory use, alcohol rubs, baths, body rubs, massages, or other similar treatment administered by a person that is not a healthcare professional licensed by the state of New York or under the supervision of such licensee. Such definition does not adequately define the meaning of what is deemed under supervision. The Brooklyn Borough Board believes that the phase under supervision of such licensees should be further clarified so the additional treatment practitioners be limited to not more than three unlicensed associates with limited permits per licensed on-site supervisor consistent with New York State law. Whereas the DCP revised definition for ambulatory diagnostic or treatment healthcare facilities, which covers medical health and mental health care facilities licensed by the state of New York, or a facility in which patients are diagnosed or treated by healthcare professionals licensed by the state of New York or by persons under the supervision of, of such licensee for medical health or mental health conditions, and where such patients are ambulatory rather than admitted, is proposed to include massage services with adequate clarification of what is being described as meeting the definition of treatment under the supervision or hours of operation in a residential zoning district. The Brooklyn Borough Board seeks to modify ZR 12 10 to define supervision for massage use as having on premise supervision of up to three unlicensed masseuse assistants having limited permits from New York State and to restrict such operation to be limited between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. Whereas DCP is proposing to permit and see one neighborhood commercial district in Brooklyn, health and fitness establishments open or enclosed, limited to 10,000 square feet of floor area per establishment where such use is not even allowed according to BSA special permit. Yet the ZR limits in C1 districts dry cleaning stores up to 2,000 square feet per establishment. Such 10,000 square feet size might lead to quality of life conflicts with abutting residential use where noise and vibration mitigation would not be adequate despite building assembly acknowledgement by a licensed acoustical engineer. The Brooklyn Borough Board seeks to modify ZR 32-15 UG 6C service establishment use so this shall be limited to 2,000 square feet when residential use shares an abutting building segment or property line wall or would be directly above such establishment. Whereas for residential permitting commercial district, DCP has proposed that high intensity use health and fitness establishments, typically other than the establishments used for exercises, including aerobics, exercise, dance, Pilates, or yoga studios, youth martial arts, and therapeutic or relaxation service establishments, including bathhouses, isolation flotation tanks, meditation facilities, spas, or tanning salons, shall be subject to the following additional enclosure and environmental conditions located within completely enclosed buildings and where such high intensity use is located in the building containing any use other than other than high intensity health and fitness use. An acoustical engineer shall verify to DOB prior to the issuance of a CFO that such use is designed according to the International Organization for Standardization ISO or American National Standards Institute standards for noise control to meet the, no the New York City noise code administered by the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. However, there is a requirement for such acoustical engineer to be licensed when verifying noise or vibration attenuation for an abutting use and such acoustical engineer is responsible is only responsible for design verification as opposed to construction verification. Therefore, the Brooklyn Borough Board seeks to modify ZR 32-413B to require an acoustical engineer to verify noise and vibration conformance as a means to protect uses that are not high intensity 
Youth health and fitness establishments share an abutting building segment or property line wall that such acoustical engineer be licensed by the state of New York and that the acoustical engineer should, in addition to design, be responsible to verify constructive performance. I love that word, acoustical engineer. That's good. That's it. Oh, thank you. So that is the resolution regarding um, health and fitness text amendment. Do we have any questions or concerns from the board? Comments, discussion? Uh, yep, it's community board uh, nine. CB9? Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, again, I think it's a, it's a common thing at this point. Like, you know, I think one of the challenges I have with this is very similar to what I have with some of the other resolutions we've heard tonight. I understand and I, you know, definitely, I, I think it's laudable in terms of the city wants to be able to promote business. But I think the way, you know, we, we need to be very careful about saying the way we do that is by removing all the roadblocks and getting rid of all the floodgates. And saying that certain things are done by as of right, uh, so I think that's one of the challenges I had with the initial um, resolution, uh, re the initial um, text amendment that's been proposed. Uh, and while I understand, I think that they, you know, I think we tried to get a little bit more surgical with some of the, the things that have been suggested in the text amendment. I, I think what we're doing is replacing one bureaucratic mechanism with another in terms of you know we're trying to put all this in the text amendment when all this gets handled by this. Um, by the board of standards and appeals already as it is. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure at this stage, or I think that, you know, we need to be very careful in terms of saying we, we do that and lift the floodgates. Um, and, and I'm not convinced. And I think that going to a point that was discussed, I think in one of the, one of the other proposals, there were certain things that were being done that they weren't sure. They said, well, this is, this is stuff that, you know, through time it's just been handed down to the different policies. Um, I think we might need to do a little bit more work before we say, okay, well, listen, this is one of the mechanisms that we need to remove. Um, just based on some of the concerns that I've heard before as well, uh, we don't know what some of the un unintended consequences might be. Uh, growing up from an era as well, massage parlor meant several things in different in circumstances. Um, and people tend to be very creative when it comes to, oh, now I can build as of right, and they'll find different ways to try and skirt certain things. And we might end up having things in communities that you know, are, are not necessarily desirable. So for that reason that I, I don't think I could support this, I think it, it's dangerous. I think that, um, you know, we, we need to be creative about the way we help businesses. I'm not sure, again, at least in the floodgates is the way we do it. Ma Madam Chair, and, and, yes. and also to be to be fair, we had, a, we had a, a CB4 come out, so we had a couple of gyms open up here illegally on top of apartment houses and eventually they were uh, shut down. Uh, but yes, we had a lot of issues in regards to gyms opening up, making believe they're gyms. So, you know, it, it really needs to uh, be more, and, and, and they're not doing anything about it anyway, unless the people start complaining, that's the only way we'll find out that it is a gym. And when you get a, a, a massage or masseuse or whatever you call them, and behind closed doors, uh, they had some of those here too that uh, PD closed down. That wasn't uh, a masseuse; it was a, a, a illegal uh, sex ring. Uh, so we have to be careful with that too. We're legalizing some of these things. We're going back to the '60s uh, and '70s, so we have to be very careful. That's why uh, this this uh, zoning thing was on there for a specific reason. And now we're going backwards instead of going forward. Okay. Thank you for your comment. Any other comments from board members? Or any of the members who submitted um, amendments for the resolution? Community board 15 voted this down unanimously. The feeling is we're taking a layer away from ourselves in approving a physical culture establishment a massage parlor, which we have a feeling we will have an influx. Fred, thank you. You said it beautifully. Community Board 10. Yeah, we uh, felt similarly as to what was expressed um, by Fred and also by Teresa. Um, we felt that the amendment was too broad sweeping. Um, we had a problem uh, with that. It permitted um, 
establishments to standalone establishments to operate as of right in residential districts or community facilities. Um, we have had problems with unlicensed um, massage parlors, which were, you know, operating and doing other illegal activities. Um, and we also had an issue um, that it removed an enforcement tool for us in that regard, because in the past we had been able to seek enforcement from um, other agencies in order to um, enforce the special permit. It was a way for us to really go about removing these illegal businesses. We also had a concern that a 10,000 square foot business um, shouldn't be included as a small business um, because in the definitions, because that, that was um, quite, quite large for our district. So those were some of the concerns of community board 10 and the reasons why we voted against. Uh, thank you for that. Okay. Um, any other uh, in, in terms of the 10,000, I just want to clarify. So in C1 districts, which Southern Brooklyn more likely still has, and because CB10 had an early rezoning, still has a lot of C1. So it's not so much that 10,000 is a small district. The key is whether the activity is very much vibration oriented, noise oriented. That's why I drafted the idea of, since you t look at a typical storefront, 20 foot store, it's not gonna be bigger than 2000 square feet. So the idea is in a 2000 square foot store, if it had a thousand square feet of gym equipment, weights, you know, whatever, then that had to have an acoustical engineer. So if a 2000 square foot store had to have that, well, if somebody had a 5,000 square foot store, but only had 2,000 square feet of massage, I'm sorry, of weights and equipment, it didn't need the engineering analysis that seemed inconsistent. So that's why I drafted the provision that it didn't matter what percent of your store, whether it was above or below 10,000, the idea is if you had more than 1,000 square feet of equipment, you're gonna generate noise if that equipment is right by a, a residential above, residential next door, a, a store next door that doesn't deserve to have the extra noise, you know, it doesn't matter. Any use that's not a gym should be protected. So putting that language into the reso seemed to address the store size to make sure anything that had noise issues above a thousand square feet of placement gets addressed. Any other discussion? Thank you, Richard. Serrano, I make a motion to approve. You make a motion to approve. Um, can I have a second? I, I second. second. Weatherspoon. One. Uh, who was second? I'm eight. Well, Weatherspoon. Community boy, one. What? Weatherspoon, okay. That's community boy, eight. I Weatherspoon. just want to clarify before the vote, the issue again of illegal massage, that's why in the resolution, putting in additional language that's already in New York state law, right? Uh, city planning st uh, staff shared that with me. The idea is if you are a masseuse with a license or if you're not a full fledged masseuse, you still have to have a permit from the state. The permit's only good for 12 months. If you don't have those credentials, we want it very, very clear in the zoning resolution so everybody can see in a public way what is legal and what is not legal because it's easier for the enforcer from whatever agency to shut down something that doesn't meet that threshold of either having a permit under supervision or an actual license. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have a motion on the floor um, to uh, to vote on this uh, on this resolution um, with the amendments. Um, Hercules, I'm going to we're going to do individual votes. Uh, I'm going to have you uh, go down uh, the roll, starting with the community boards. No one seconded. I did. I think yes. I believe I had eight. There was a second. Yeah. There was yes. A second. I had like a several. Yes. Yeah. So just to confirm. Uh, um, okay. Motion by uh, 15 and then second by eight to the record. Okay. Correct. Thank you. All right.
Thank you, Serena. We'll go down the list. Okay. Um, <clears throat> community board one. Yes. Community board two. Community board three. Yes. Community board four. Yes. Community board five. Community board six. Community board seven. Community board eight. Yes. Community board nine. No. Community board 10. No. Community board 11. No. Community TV 11 board. is no. 11 is no received. Thank you. Community board 13. I, I'm sorry, at 12, I, I. Yeah, they didn't respond, but community board 12. Community board 13. Community board 14. Hey, just a minute. I'm getting ready to do a vote. Just a minute. You said abstain CB 14? Yes, sir. CB 15, community board 15. No. Community board 16. Um, no. Community board 17. No. Community board 18. <clears throat> that ends it for community boards. Moving on to council. Council district 42 on his baron. Council district 36, Robert Cornegy. Councilwoman Lori Cumbo. Did someone speak? Okay. Lori Cumbo. Councilwoman Lori Cumbo. Sorry. Yes. Councilwoman Dharma Diaz. Councilman Matthew G. <clears throat> Councilman Justin Brennan. Councilman Justin Brennan. Councilman Kalman Yeager. Councilman Brad Lander. Councilman Stephen Levin. Councilman Alan Mazel. Uh, yes. Councilwoman Alika Samuel. Abstain. Councilman Carlos Menchaca. Yes. Councilman Antonio Reynoso. Councilman Mark Traeger. Councilwoman Farrah Lewis. Borough President's Office. Yes. Okay, I'm counting. Does not carry six no, seven yes, and two abstain. Eight to seven. Give me one second, Mr. Camacho. I count eight yeses, so as was mentioned, it does not carry. Thank you for that. So the motion does not carry uh, for the board. Um, so uh, with that being said, uh, Richard. Serena, could you just give me those numbers again? Yes. Okay. Um, so for on the for yes, I, we have eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, we have eight yeses, and then for Firm um, knows one, two, three, four, five, six. I have six knows, and then pardon me. Point of order. Point of order is 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 seven yeses, six no, and two abstain. I have. You said you have seven yeses. I have. Yep. I have. So what I have is CB one yes, CB three yes. Uh, CB four, Mr. Kamar, I have you have yes. Did uh -huh. I right? 
Yes. I have seen eight. Yes. Um, five. That's a tally. Huh? Pardon me. That's a tally. Okay. That's five. And who yes, else? House member combo. Yes. I have uh -huh. House member Mizell. Yes. Council member Chaka. Yes. And board president. Yes. Okay. And just confirming okay. again, I do have eight yeses. Uh, well. And the tally immigrant report knows. And I there's have, two no's. I have on no's, I have six six no's, CB sorry. nine, no, CB ten, no, CB eleven, no, CB fifteen, no, CB sixteen, no, CB seventeen, no. Those the and those no's tally six. Six. And then um, members who ab abstain, I have CB 14. And I also have uh, council member Ampli Samuel. Yeah, but Serrano, yes. eight and eight is now 16. We don't have a quorum. We need 18 for quorum. E we need 18 for quorum, but as it stand, some of the members we seem have to have exit. We have three abs exit. abstentions. Yeah. So the, some of the members who were present for the meeting um, when we had quorum have exited the meeting and therefore did not vote. So either which way it wouldn't, I, it wouldn't carry. So am I incorrect? Yes, you're right. So they, members they, who they, they only, they only carry for, for, for the quorum for the meeting, but they don't carry for the quorum for the vote. Cause they're not here to vote. They're not, they're not, they're not, they're not here to vote. How many, sorry, how many abstentions were there? I, for the, we have two. Two. Yes. yes. And those were for whom again? Community board 14 and um, Ampi Samuel. Oh, I'd like to make a suggestion that. CB9 abstain? Uh, CB9, I have CB9. You want to, yeah, I have CB9 no. is no. Oh, that was no. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's, yeah. I wrote it up. Oh, so I'd like to put a suggestion if somebody would consider making a motion for the same conditions, but as a no vote, if uh, people would like to consider voting that in order to put the conditions to the city planning commission. So if someone's interested in making that motion, if not, then where we can either potentially revote this next month or based on more boards voting um, or not revisit it. So what you're saying is to, to add the, the amendments only? Correct. What that the you? amendment would be to vote no with the same conditions. And what would that do? It, it would allow our conditions to be sent to the city planning commission, not as a borough board resolution, but a reflection of the voting members. We have to use that language because we don't have a quorum. I, Robert Camacho, make the recommendation. Okay. CB4, make a recommendation. And is there a second? CB11, second. CB11, second. Okay. Um, so, may I have clarification on this that yeah. motion? So is the recommendation um, to simply write a letter to DCP saying that we failed to obtain a quorum, but here are our concerns, more or less? Well, well point of order. If we don't have a quorum, we can't make motion. Of point of order. This we motion's can't. out of order if we don't have a quorum. To approval. Exactly. I'm sorry. I, I oh, hold didn't on, I'm sorry. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. Yeah. Richard, go ahead. So I think Fred, you were saying the fact that we we don't yeah. even have point a point of order. Yeah, if we don't have a quorum. Yeah. The, the motion's not in order. We, we can't Correct. vote. Correct. Without a quorum, we could only say that of the members present, we have to use language. So it's not an official position of the borough board. It's what the sentiment was of the voting members. We have to use critical lead in language so that the conditions with a concept of no could at least be expressed to inform the city planning commission. So my question is, when you're saying conditions, are you talking about the concerns that were voiced at the meeting? 
it would be the same thing in the draft resolution, except that instead of saying it with an approval, it would be saying it with a disapproval. And back me up on this one. I don't think so. So do I, Lori. I don't think we should go along with that. I think it should die on the wayside. I think so, that that's an improper expression, possibly, of what went on. Um, so if we take a vote, a anybody? Motion. Excuse me. There was a motion. there was a motion on the floor, and there was a second. No, so no, anybody? No, 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 so now we're discussing. It. No form. If there's no form, the motion is improper. It's out of order. I, so I'm not comfortable motion. with that. Richard Berrick, I am not comfortable. First of all, I don't think the objections are clear enough. I don't think they're forceful enough. I think the sentiment of the boards that are totally adverse to this have to be really spelled out. So again, the idea is to vote against the resolution. And if enough people want to vote against the resolution, then there's just nothing, there's just no consensus, and that's fine. I, I think similar to the other uh, resolution, I think, you know, we can probably bring it back at the next borough board meeting, and we can take our chances and see what happens with that. Uh, I definitely intend, at least for my board, to, to we're still going to pursue the issues and have the conversation. And perhaps, you know, even if we can't do it as a unified borough board, we can still make sure that, um, you know, the feelings of each of the respective boards and, and the viewpoints that were shared today still get to uh, the city planning commission. I think that might be the best course of action at this point. Um, so at this point, um, individual boards will, uh, some who have taken up the matter, some who are not, will try to uh, stake their individual position on this, on this item. That's a consensus. Uh, I, I, fair enough, Richard. Richard, the motion then carries, so it shouldn't be going forward. It should be a no vote. Well, no, yeah, I mean the the motion the motion then carry. Um, I believe at this point, all we could do is that we could encourage individual boards, um, to uh, go through their their chain accordingly. Um, bringing up to so their is that a so is that a recommendation? Because if they said no and they voted no on 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 a, a motion, then you, you're making you're making your own recommendation on what you want them to to put. They said no. No, the the resolution, the, but that's just for the resolution for the board board. So no matter what, this item is still out there. So uh, this is just one resolution for this particular body to take on as a collective unit, and there is no collective decision on these items. These will still be reviewed and has been reviewed by individual boards who were able to take it up. And also, as Fred had mentioned, boards who probably have to have time because their meetings are later who have not taken up. So the issue is still out to still out there. It's just that this body has uh, this body has not approved collectively this resolution. We don't. Which I means we won't. Which means that the borough board won't have any input in the situation. Correct. Uh, the borough board would not have any input in city planning. The board although, is a collective unit. Although the language in the draft resolution, board members, borough board members are free to bring that language to their community boards. They could cherry pick, pick any parts of that draft language. And bring it to the discussion of their community boards so that our collective conversation tonight can still be of benefit to the community boards that haven't taken a position yet. Or if any boards have taken a position that want to update their position. Can I ask a question, Richard? Richard? Yes, CB1, yes. Uh, the boards that's already submitted their res had a meeting on this and submitted their resolution. Can that be sent to city planning? Richard, are you on Richard? You're on mute. Yes, I believe it can. Yes, it can. Richard, you're on mute. But 
Richard? I didn't hear that clearly enough, if that could be. Uh, CB1 has voted on this item already, and it could go as they voted, it could go to city planning. Um, I don't know if all the boards know or are utilizing the portal, but on the portal um, that we had a meeting on, um, it has updated some of the boards who have voted on these particular items. Yes, conditional. So those updates is there. I do encourage everyone to take a look at where the other boards stand by making use of that portal too as well. And just also checking it just to make sure the information that's on there is actually you know up to date for your particular board. So Richard, yeah. I'll let you answer the question. Yes. Yeah, Richard, my question was because I know that my committee put in a lot of time and energy in this and made sure they heard it. And I know we sent a resolution, so I'm wondering if individual boards that send in resolutions, can that be sent to city planning? Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, the boards that have taken a position citywide, right? You could see it on the ZAP portal, but nothing prevents a board from updating their position if they learn more. There's certainly, that, that's fine. If you if uh, a board wants to revisit, that's fine. If a board never wants to visit, that's also fine. But if you're going to do it at all, you got to do it before the council acts to be informative. And certainly, okay. if you do it before the commission acts, even better. Okay. Um, so I hope that answers everyone's question. So as a stand now, the resolution uh, uh, fail. Um, uh, we would. At this point, I guess we could close out this item. I just want to take a, a chance to thank um, Dylan and his colleague from city planning uh, for uh, being with us this evening. Um, the time now is 739. Um, with no other further discussion on this item, um, is there, I'd like to go into um, the closing uh, item on the agenda, which is it's any new business or any new business for members? Any um, old business for members? Oh, uh, this might be old business. Oh yes, you do. I remember Fred. Yes, you did have you had something that you want to raise in new. Does it be new business? As, as you new business, go ahead. Uh, right, and I'm not sure if we can actually do it. We might have to take care of this offline administratively. But um, uh, last so year, bring it to the board's uh, t attention. So, and then we could always yeah. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so we've started going to meetings at 4 p.m. Uh, this is something that was done uh, after a conversation, I guess, with the, the chairs, just because logistically it made more sense. To Fred, could you just speak up? I can't hardly hear. Sure. Is that any better? Better. Thank you. Sorry about that. So last year we had actually moved our meeting time. Originally we used to meet at 6 o'clock. Um, but because of the pandemic and a lot of the business practices, we were able to meet earlier. With the city reopening, um, four o'clock meetings might become more problematic as people are probably going to have work conflicts, i.e., I am people. <laughs> so I wanted for the board to be able to consider actually returning back to 6 p.m. start time. Um, I think that fortunately, because we did win the victory with respect to open meetings and being able to do this uh, virtually, hopefully we can, you know, that, that makes it a little bit easier. But um, you know, I just wanted for the board to be able to consider going back to that just because of work conflicts and other things. Now that we're city's prospectively reopening, I would support that. Um, Four o'clock meetings significantly cut into my work day, um, and they're difficult for me to get to um, because. I'm working, <laughs> um, so I would love for someone to uh, reconsider that. Um, any other comments regarding um, adjustment of time to take into consideration? Yeah, only only six o'clock is fine with me. I make a motion to adjourn. Okay, we make a motion. Okay, um, so there's no, <laughs> there's, so we're, we're we're okay with either our times. People are open to moving back to six o'clock. Uh, just due to you know the executive order, as you guys know, we're going to resume uh, virtually, fully virtually uh, with board board until until December. Um, and as you guys see that some of the items that are coming on the pipeline are very um, they're very meaty and bulky and 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 it take a lot of time to kind of dive into. 
Um, so take that into consideration as well. Um, but uh, I will bring the concerns back. We already discussed about just in the meantime, and we'll be open to it too as well. That's not an issue if it's fine with all the board members. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? John Alexander Bakker Dean makes a motion to adjourn the meeting. Okay, second. Oh, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Wonderful. Have a good night, everyone. Be safe. Be safe. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Stay safe. Take care. Good, Good night. night. Be safe, everyone. David, if you could, um, I did a chat that I want to send over the city planning. David, you'll get the chat, right? 